Yeah. Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to this Dorset Police and Crime Panel meeting, reviewing the uh, quarter two. Uh, my name is Mike Short. I'll be uh, chairing this meeting today. Uh, Mark, could I hand over to you, if you wouldn't mind, to run through sort of introductions uh, and apologies? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So um, I'm Mark Aaron. I'm the, the service manager for Assurance and the, the lead officer for the for the panel. In terms of apologies, we've got apologies from Councillor Barrow and Councillor Gorringe. Um, Councillor Maidman has also given apologies, certainly for the first part of the meeting, but may may join us uh, later. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to run through all members um, of, the, of the panel, followed by the OPCC and then officers. And if you could just um, briefly uh, introduce yourselves, if, if you may, as, as I if I do that. So if I, I start off with members of the panel, first of all. So um, Councillor Dove. Um, good morning. I'm Councillor Dove, Vice Chair of the Panel and the BCP Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Farquhar. Good morning, Councillor George Farquhar, Member of the Panel and a BCP Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Fry. Good morning. Good morning. Les Fry, Dorchester West. Thank you. Councillor Haynes. Good morning, I'm Councillor May Haynes, a member of the panel and a BCP councillor. Thank you. Councillor Jesperson. Good morning, Councillor Sherry Jesperson, new to this panel, and I'm a Dorset Council councillor for Hillforts and Upper Tarrants. Thank you. Ian McVee. Uh, morning, Ian McVee, one of the two independents on the panel. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Northover. Hi, I'm Councillor Northover. I'm a councillor for Muspiff and Stroudon Park, um, BCP area. Um, I'm an independent as well. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Taylor. Good morning, Councillor David Taylor here. I'm Dorset Councillor representing Charmers of Marrick and also a panel member of Police and Crime. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just check that um, Councillor Maidment's not on the call at the moment before moving on to the APCC. Okay. Okay. So to the to the uh, APCC, um, Martin Underhill. Good morning, uh, Martin Underhill, Police Crime Commissioner. Thank you. Simon Bullock. Uh, good morning. I'm Simon Bullock, Chief Executive to the Police and Crime Commissioner. Simon. On me there, Simon. Okay. Oh, sorry, did that not work? Uh, good morning. I'm Simon Bullock, and I'm Chief Executive to the Police and Crime Commissioner. Thanks, thanks Simon. And um, Adam. Good morning, Adam Harold. I'm the Director of Operations for the Police and Crime Commissioner. Thank you. And uh, Judy Strange. Good morning, I'm the Chief Finance Officer for the Police and Crime Commissioner. Thank you very much. And then finally, if I move to um, officers, um, Jim McManus. Uh, good morning all, I'm Jim McManus. Uh, I'm one of Dorset Council's Corporate Directors, Finance and Commercial. Thank you. And um, Elaine Tibble. Good morning, I'm Elaine Tibble and I'm from Dorset Council's Democratic Services team. Okay. Thank you. That's that's the roll call. Have I can I just check that I haven't missed anybody? Okay. Back, back to you then, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for the minutes, could it be noted that Councillor Bill Pike was removed from the panel and replaced by Councillor Sherry Jesperson? Moving on to my to the minutes. Um, can I assume that everyone has read the minutes and that there are no issues that people would want to raise uh, as part of the uh, these minutes? Has anyone got any points they want to raise? No, thank you very much. So in that case then, um, Mark, the minutes can be signed off electronically. Uh, Mark, declarations of interest. Um, I could just, just check really then with, with uh, members of the panel that no one's got any interest to declare. Okay, I'll just leave that for a few seconds. Okay, thanks, Chair. Yeah, thank 
Thank you for that. And now moving on to item four, public participation. Back to you again, Mark. Yes, so um, we, we received uh, one set of questions, but it was outside of the uh, time for submission. So unfortunately, we won't be able to consider that at this meeting today. Thank you very much. Uh, and that moves us on to the, the meat of this meeting, which is item five, the police and crime plan, uh, quarterly monitoring report. Um, if I could kindly hand over to the police and crime practitioner, uh, Martin, um, to outline um, how your office and yourself have been um, working on the police and crime plan as uh, over the last quarter. Over to you, Martin. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, panel. Um, so today I'm reporting to you on quarter two um, for a uh, progress report. And um, I suppose the monthly or the quarterly monitoring report on a page, I'll give you 12 highlights and then I'll go through each strand. Um, so uh, we supported a number of fraud and cyber campaigns uh, under the protecting people at risk of harm. Uh, we won a diversity award and we extended our youth mentoring project. Um, under working with our communities, we obviously held the uh, antisocial behaviour survey with over 4,000 responses. The SNAP uh, survey of COVID-19 was done and we were successful in our straight, Safer Streets Fund bid for Boscombe and Pokestown um, for supporting victims, witnesses and reducing reoffending. The Rasso Improvement Project commences, recommissioning work uh, for vital services uh, was undertaken, again a SNAP delivery, and uh, the Summer Domestic Abuse and Sexual Violence campaigns were launched with Dorset Police. And on the last pillar, Transforming for the Future, the complaint review work that continues. The force was rated as good for its crime data integrity and support and scrutiny of Dorset's response to COVID-19 was undertaken by myself and my office. Um, so that's it in a snapshot. I'll now take you through each pillar. And there is dialogue to go with some of the uh, points because there are some um, worrying figures in here which you, the panel will have picked up so the first one protecting people at risk of harm if you look at the top right you will see that domestic abuse crimes are virtually level domestic, domestic abuse incidents are nine percent up and re recorded hate crime 36 percent up so let's uh, just give you a bit of an overview of why that is so domestic abuse crimes were essentially unchanged um, in this quarter uh, and the long term trend actually is flat as well. So um, you can draw conclusions from that, that there is no specific increase in domestic abuse uh, in the COVID period, as the number of domestic abuse crimes reported to the police has actually reduced slightly compared to last year. And actually to give that a bit of context, that's unusual. There was always a view that um, domestic abuse would go through the roof with the first lockdown uh, and in some parts of the country has but hasn't here. So domestic abuse incidents though are up nine percent which falls in line with an increase we've also seen in the issuing of domestic abuse public protection notices or PPNs as we call them which have increased by about 10 percent in the last 12 months and that is an increasing trend on last year. So we're seeing an increasing trend of PPNs being issued. That's a good thing. That means that policing and its partners are alive to uh, an increased threat and are identifying that increased threat. Domestic abuse crimes are essentially unchanged, but incidents have gone up by 9%. Now I know some of the panel will be looking at the screen thinking, I don't understand the difference between an incident and a crime. And that's okay to feel that because the public and uh, various other people get confused. So let's just help you with that definition. Domestic abuse is any incident or pattern of incidents of controlling, coercive, threatening behaviour, violence or abuse between those aged 16 or over who are or have been intimate partners or family members regardless of gender or sex. This abuse can encompass but is not limited to psychological, physical, sexual, financial and or emotional damage. Um, so that's the crime. An incident is a report that contains any of those elements of that definition 
but the reported circumstances fall short of a criminal offence. So, for an example, um, an ex-partner shouting or arguing with another ex-partner, so two, two people who split up shouting, screaming at each other, that would be recorded as a domestic violence incident, but it wouldn't be recorded as a crime. And therein lies the answer, I think. Um, people have been confined to their houses more. Um, it's very much like uh, with everyone in their own houses uh, and not um, going off to work. I think that's the issue, which is why we've seen a 9% increase. The recorded hate crime, 36, 37% is uh, worrying at the, at the, to say the least. So let's just talk through that. In the early phase of the pandemic, um, bear in mind that this is quarter two, we saw an increase in hate crimes of 37%, but since then they've returned to, uh, to the usual levels. So um, in other words, this is a spike. And I think it would be fair to say that you could uh, be excused for saying this is a COVID spike. There was a, a concern that increased tension between neighbours was driving this increase. And so the force worked with uh, partners to send reassurance messages through the diverse network of community groups uh, and with Prejudice Free Dorset to encourage reporting. Um, and, but our recent audit shows 90% compliance in, in recording hate crime uh, as seen by the uh, HMI CFRS. So we're making really good progress about recording hate crime. I don't think it's being lost along the way. Um, you can't be complacent with a 37% increase, but that was a spike that's now disappeared. And I think it's fair to assume that that was because of COVID. Um, staying on this uh, pillar, we provided funding for free mental health workshops, uh, which I think I mentioned to the panel last time. And that was uh, aimed at the public, but also aimed at emergency services personnel, not just policing. Uh, and they were delivered uh, online in mid-September by Dorset Mind. Our Action for Children mentoring project, which has been impacted by COVID-19, has been extended until uh, this month. And um, the Adult Return Home Initiative is live, making over 350 referrals. To remind the panel, uh, everywhere in the country, in England and Wales, will do a follow-up interview of a child who goes missing and then returns home. Um, but we don't do it for adults, so it's something that I've always campaign for so we, we actually brought it in uh, this year and the idea is that one we can identify if you like frequent flyers people who go missing a lot to try and understand why but also it's about risk assessing those people and seeing whether they have suicidal ideations so that's uh, pillar one chair do you want me to go through all four pillars uh, and then take questions or do you want to do questions at the end of each pillar no if i could ask uh, pillar leads if you wouldn't mind that's um uh, Lisa, you're leading. Unfortunately, Peter's not with us today. Um, uh -huh. If I can ask you to um, lead on the uh, support and scrutiny of uh, Pillar One, that uh, if you would please. Yeah. Okay. I um, I just have a question again about the domestic abuse incidents versus crimes, and I just wondered if the if it's to do with resources and that. Um, that it, there's more resources needed to um, gain the evidence and speak to people to be able to um, have have something that can be reported as a crime rather than as an incident. Is there is there a grey area between a, an incident and a crime at all? Uh, well, there's two questions. There is one is is there a grey area between the two, and the other is um, basically our police um, sleeving the crime, keeping the incident because it's less work. Um, I, both those are operational questions. I'm going to ask Steve Lyne, who is uh, representative of police today, to come in on both, please. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, thank you, Councillor. Uh, no, I don't think there's a grey area between it. There is a, a, a fine definition there around recording domestic abuse incidents. So we still ris uh, assess risk. Uh, and then uh, actually if it meets the threshold of what would be termed a crime in law. So I don't think there's a grey area there. There's very clear definitions that come out from it. Resourcing wise, um, no, it's not a resourcing issue that links into that whatsoever. So uh, incidents still attended, 
uh, and the officers will make an assessment of they'll assess the risk, the threat that comes from that, and then they'll make uh, a um, uh, they'll investigate it and make a decision whether a crime's actually been committed, and obviously follow through with that, or if it's a domestic abuse incident, both of which still go through the formal recording processes. So it's not a resourcing issue; it's just the difference between an incident and a crime. Thank Thanks. you. That's great to be able to understand that. Um, my other question is about. Oh dear. So are you frozen, Lisa? Yeah, you're back. Oh, I just, I just um, lost you there for a second. Um, I just wondered if you could uh, give a little bit of an idea of the sorts of situations where. Um, adults go missing and because I thought that was quite interesting that there was 350 referrals uh, to me that sounds like quite quite a lot of um, um, help that's been able to be given to people and I just wondered is it elderly people is it young people or is it a mixture I just wondered if you had some um, a, a flavour of the sort of uh, thing you're finding there uh, again I'll bring Steve in I don't know the answer to that question um, Steve? So the vast majority of our missing people are under 18s um, uh, and uh, uh, that's quite a considerable uh, number from there. The rest of it does go across the whole of the spectrum, so uh, slightly higher in what I described the 20s and 30s, um, but uh, uh, we, you know we see missing persons episodes all the way up to um, uh, uh, the uh, age of 90. OK, thank you. That's all. That's all of my questions. Thank you very much. Uh, panel members will get an opportunity um, to ask questions overall later on um, at the end of this uh, series when Martin's completed uh, panel, the pillar lead number four. Uh, Martin, could I ask you to move on to uh, pillar lead two, please, or pillar two, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. So. Um... For members of the public watching, the second pillar of the Police and Crime Plan is working with our communities. Um, I suppose one of our highlights was the antisocial behaviour survey. Um, and the key finding from that, obviously, that members of the panel saw my blog, but uh, the key findings of that uh, were that most people were confused between the three types of antisocial behaviour, which is exactly what we thought when we put the survey out, to be fair. Um, and uh, explaining to the public who to contact in relation to those different types of antisocial behaviour um, has been a really big step forward, not just for uh, the police, but for, in particular, I have to mention Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole have done a really good campaign this year in relation to fly tipping and in relation to antisocial behaviour um, uh, and educating the public um, or informing the public as to uh, the right agency to speak to. Um, we also did a snap survey into the enforcement of the new COVID-19 uh, measures uh, and 1,800 people responded in less than two days and 92% supported the approach taken by Dorset agencies, not just the police, in relation to COVID. Uh, that, that, of course, was in September uh, in this roller coaster that we call 2020. Uh, and of course, all the guidelines and the tiers have changed since then. Um, we successfully bid for 266,000 from the Safe Streets Fund, and the money is being used further to expand the Bobby Van scheme, extend CCT coverage and tackle burglary and acquisitive crime in Pokeston and Bos Boscombe. Um, and I also, uh, as the Deputy Lead for Road Safety, supported a National Road Safety Survey. But rather like the last pillar, I'm going to pick up a couple of crime stats in the top right. Uh, both of them are to be celebrated, actually, but they are big discrepancies on what you would normally see in Dorset. So um, non-dwelling burglary down by 36 percent. And in fact, uh, burglary dwelling is, is down in a similar way. Uh, and, and it's not rocket science, is it? Um, people have been at home more, therefore less empty houses, less burglaries. Um, but home burglaries have been reducing year on year anyway, and we are 16 percent down in the 12 months to March 2020, which has to be fantastic news uh, because having been burgled myself, that is a traumatic crime for anyone. Uh, and then are killed or seriously injured um, down by 16%, always dangerous to 
take a snapshot in that space because it can go up or down very quickly. But it's good to see a 16 percent reduction. Um, that's it for me, Chair. Over to questions on Pillar 2. Thank you very much for that, Martin. Um, Pillar 2, um, Les, uh, Les Fry and David Taylor, if you wouldn't mind leading off, please. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner, thank you for the figures. They look really good. Um, how much do we congratulate you and Dorset Police or Boris for these figures? Um, in relation to, I'm um, looking at particularly the non-dwelling burglary down to 36.7% at a time when all the offices and premises potentially were empty. There was an opportunity there to go around there. Shoplifting is also down 29%. Really good, but with the shop shut, I guess they didn't have anywhere to go. Um, and antisocial behaviour up by 2.7%. So really, I'm lumping them all together and say, how much are those figures related to COVID, the lockdown and the impact on society? So uh, I'll, I'll be doing a COVID update later, um, but let's take those in turn. The one that I am surprised by is burglary OTD, other than dwelling, uh, for exactly the point you raised. Um, we've had two different lockdowns, which means businesses have been empty. Uh, and I am surprised that we uh, have been fortunate to have such a massive reduction um, because uh, all that could be going to deduct from that is that these premises have good alarm systems because I thought we'd go up in that space. The uh, antisocial behaviour increase, um, we, we know, in fact, I told the panel last time that we had a 14% increase uh, during the first lockdown in antisocial behaviour. We know that uh, any call about COVID, uh, and I'll bring Steve in a, in a minute, to give us a rough flavour of what's happening with COVID phone calls. But um, we know that every call on COVID uh, is recorded as antisocial behaviour. So you're, dramatically, you are going to see an increase in your antisocial behaviour. And actually, to only see a 2 or 3% increase is uh, ma markedly down on the last time I reported to this panel. Um, the other thing you mentioned, Les, was, what was the other one? Uh, that sort of lumps them all up. And, and how much of that antisocial behaviour you've got the COVID figures possibly pushing them up, does that mean real antisocial behaviour, what I would call antisocial behaviour, the, the youth fighting those things in the street, has gone down as well because of the lockdown? Uh, well, my answer to that, I think, is yes, but I'm bringing Steve in. He's the expert. Uh, but actually, if you take the COVID figures away, I would have thought, actually, our real, because you could, could say yeah. we, we're never going to have that again, are we? Uh, it, the real antisocial behaviour has gone down. But um, let's see what Steve says. Thank you, Commissioner. So um, just to explain why uh, it falls into the ASB category on computer systems, uh, everything goes into a category so that it can get recorded onto as an incident so that we can then decide if a deployment is required. Uh, and antisocial behaviour is the area that it got put under from there. Uh, and although we can break it down into the various different elements of that, um, uh, the um, there is then the, the natural increase around antisocial behaviour that comes for it. We have done some work to have a look at keyword searching, uh, and checking around COVID within there. Uh, and your assumption there, Councillor Fry, is right. There is a reduction in what you might call uh, non-COVID related antisocial behaviour versus the increase that you'll see around people reporting breaches of the rules of six, for example, groups gathering. Uh, and in the very early parts of uh, COVID, uh, you know, youths and groups like that coming together and drinking and things like that. So all important for us to be able to recognise and manage between there. Um, but there has been work undergone from there, and that's the reassurance that I can offer. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Commissioner. Can I bring in the fact of the, fact of the excellent figures for people feeling safe in Dorset, 94%, and also the fact that that's part of the National Road Safety Survey. How is that getting on? How are we really doing on that? Uh, the Road Safety Survey has had quite a, a dramatic uh, response, actually. Tens of thousands of responses have come in now uh, wow. across the whole of England and Wales. We're still analysing it, but there's some really useful stuff in there. We haven't done a survey like that for years, so uh, I look forward to reporting to the panel next time. Congratulations and thank you. Thanks okay. very much. Let's see if I ask Martin to move on to Pillar 3, please. Thank you. So, um, uh, Pillar 3 for the public watching is supporting victims, witnesses and reducing reoffending. In other words, both sides of the coin, um, the people who've been affected by crime and the people who commit the crime. Um, so we, we actively engaged very quickly with victim services to ensure that we have the capacity and the ability really to continue to provide services to victims of crime during the first lockdown and thereafter. Uh, and I don't think we've done too badly, actually, and, and that's probably reflected in what you've seen there in those stats, uh, victim satisfaction, old experience, 74%. Um, 
all three PCCs undertook a project with the CPS Wessex uh, and the three chief constables to share best practice regarding rape and serious sexual assault investigations, uh, RASO as we call them. Uh, and, and that I think is bringing a more uniformed approach, which is more stable. We undertook lots of recommissioning work, which I did mention to the panel last time, uh, including the Shores, which is the Sexual Assault Referral Centre in Bournemouth, Restorative Justice and the Independent Sexual Advisor Service. And in July, I provided funding towards the fourth summer domestic abuse and sexual violence communications campaign. The one thing on the top right that I would highlight here is Restorative Dorset, uh, 135 referrals, which is good. It grows every time and um, we obviously need to do more in that space, uh, as does police in general in, in England and Wales. The only other thing in this pillar, which isn't on the sheet, is uh, serious sexual offences. They're down 19% in the year to date, a reduction of 230 offences, um, 1,242 to 1,011. This is on top of a flat year in the year to March 2020. Um, so you'll notice in, in my updates at the moment, I'm not just giving you the three months, I'm giving you the rolling 12 month figure just to show if it is COVID related. And we don't think this is. Um, it, it goes against a lot of thinking, actually. I touched on this in pillar one. When we've had our first lockdown, various people, including me, were worried about domestic abuse and serious sexual offences going through the roof because offenders and victims will be locked up in the same house for much longer than normal. And that hasn't been proved to be the case in Dorset in either category. Um, and while there may, may be some impact and potential underreporting, there is also the narrative that greater awareness, stronger campaigns and neighbours at home uh, and, and there's been less nighttime economy have all had a positive impact. Obviously, obviously when it comes to serious sexual offences, a lot of those happen in the nighttime economy. So over to May Haynes, I think, is the person asking questions on this category. May, please. So May, you're on, on, um, on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. We can. Yes, we can. You can. Okay. I'd like to thank uh, the Commissioner for the report. Uh, it's quite comprehensive. Obviously, my concern here is the um, domestic violence uh, and domestic abuse. Although in the report, it actually says that it doesn't show that COVID had actually had any significant impact but nonetheless i think because this is a quarter two report um uh, that perhaps this was in the earlier part of the lockdown so therefore people were not uh, as frazzled if i can use that word because it hadn't been going on for too long but but i'm just thinking um coming back to the point of capacity and capability Ability, there is indication. I think um, mentioned in pillar one that domestic violence incidents has actually gone up by nine percent. Whether going forward, a commissioner's confident that we still have that capacity and capability, given that there are also other calls on the resource, the limited resources available. Um. I'll go back to Stephen again because that's quite an operational question, but I will comment on two things. Um, I am capable, I am confident about the capacity and capability because, as you'll hear in my COVID update, the government have given funding to us to police COVID um, and therefore normal policing can do normal business, if that makes sense. But I'm going to bring Steve in again just to reassure you. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so certainly in regard to uh, domestic abuse, domestic violence counsellor, um, uh, I, I can offer that reassurance. Um, any uh, amount of demand that comes in, we obviously ass assess that what we call threat, risk and harm. Domestic abuse, domestic violence, vulnerability will always be high up that list and always be prioritised about it. So I've got no concerns around our ca capability and capacity uh, to respond to those particular incidents or more widely across uh, Dorset in regard to policing for that. But it's absolutely a priority uh, and we recognise it due to the vulnerability. Thank you. Thank, thank, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and the other thing I was going to mention was obviously I really welcome the recommission, recommissioning of those services. Um, it's currently showing as amber. I'm just, 
just wondering, uh, because obviously it's just been recommissioned, whether you're confident that it will actually be in place so that we can actually therefore use provide those services as they're needed going going forward, particularly the independent sexual violence advisor service. I think that's that's really quite important. Yeah, I, I share your view, um, and I would agree with your uh, dialogue there. Um, that they are that colour because we have just recommissioned. And of course, the SARC is now going through um, another process of um, not nationalisation, but it is going to be outsourced to um, the NHS in the next year. So um, these are not unstable, but they're changing commissions. Um, but I will bring Adam in for my team just to see. Oh, Ad, in fact, Simon put his hand up, so we'll, we'll come in for Simon. Uh, thanks, Commissioner. So um, I think, um, Councillor Haynes, if I might just pick up the, the previous point as well, actually, and just a, just a quick response. So I think it's important, although we've heard directly from the force, I think it's important for us to just mention what the OPCC does to scrutinise the force, because obviously that's what we're here to discuss. So with regards to the capacity of the force and with regards to the, the level of domestic abuse incidents and crimes over the, um, the ongoing period, um, um, I attend a strategic performance board on the Commissioner's behalf, where we look at this, these informations in detail um, and Steve Lyon and his team present the statistics and we scrutinise them as a force and I'm there as, um, as the OPCC rep on that. And we, we have a look at that data in minutia and go through um, uh, the basis of the force management statement. Force management statement is the uh, national strategy that set out that um, helps forces and OPCCs to understand their demand and how they can mitigate that demand. So it looks at things like demand, capacity, capability, the security of supply, all these kinds of issues. So we look at the an ongoing basis, the ability of the force to meet its demand and its expected demand. So hopefully that gives a, a, just a, a note of assurance. And then just on the recommissioning side, so um, OPCC has some pretty um, stringent processes in place. So um, we're obviously subject to um, to a number of procurement rules, as you would um, anticipate. Um, so we, um, we we obviously follow those. Um, and and fundamentally as well, we um, we are relatively practiced at this as well. So we've had the opportunity over the years of recommissioning a number of different quite large scale contracts. Uh, we've got a very good and experienced commissioning manager. Um, we've got the opportunity to um, to leverage support from Southwest Procurement, uh, Southwest Procure, uh, sorry, sorry, Southwest Police Procurement. Um, that's a, a four force um, <coughs> procurement department that spans the region, um, and that supports um, four of the five police forces across the Southwest. Uh, Avon Somerset currently isn't part of that arrangement, but they also help us to to um, support our procurement processes regionally as well. So we've got. Good support, good understanding, good processes in place, um, and um, the um, senior management team. Um, so uh, Adam, myself, Martin, and Julie, we look at that um, information on a, on a pretty much an ongoing basis as well. Uh, that that's thank. You. Thank you, thank you very much for that, Simon. That is that is reassuring, and then obviously we'll see um, in the next quarter report how that's actually doing because I think that's quite an important aspect of this pillar. Thank you. Thanks very much, May. Uh, and and for the public that are watching this, just remind you that the, this is the quarterly two report we're, we're overseeing or scrutinising, supporting, and uh, that runs from sort of September through to December. Uh, Martin, uh, could I ask you to lead on um, pillar four, if you wouldn't mind, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Just before we leave, um, oh no, it is, sorry, in pillar four, we've got normally an update from Barry Gorringe, but I don't think he's here today, is he? Um, no, he's not. Okay. Um, so pillar four is transforming for the future. Um, and we have uh, begun in February 2020. Uh, we uh, the law changed uh, in relation to police complaints and the appeal system and since then we've seen 14 police complaint reviews conducted by the OPCC. I think it's really exciting. I've always said I don't believe police should mark their own homework. This is another step in the right direction, removing policing from investigating itself or reviewing itself. Um, I'm just going to bring Adam in. He leads on this for, for my team. 
Thank you, Martin. Yes, yeah, so we've um, we've established this work um, well and truly within the OPCC now, and um, we look forward to the IOPC, the Office of Police Conduct, publishing their national data, um, hopefully sometime next year, so that we can check our performance against other areas. But as the Commissioner has said, Corsa 2 saw 14 police complaint reviews come into the office, and generally speaking, what we're seeing is an increase in the number of reviews that we would expect to see uh, versus what the force handled in terms of appeals. Now, those are still relatively low numbers, so we were expecting around one a week to come through, and we're getting um, about two a week at the moment. Now, it's very early days, hard to say exactly why that is. Um, a couple of theories. One is that the definition of complaint has been changed, so it's an expression of dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. The intention of that, and I've, I've talked about this before, is to make it easier for the public to have their um, complaints logged and for the force to take on that feedback. So if you have more things put through the system, you are likely perhaps to have more reviews. Um, and the other um, um, aspect, uh, the other aspect of that potentially is in the spirit of the legislation, of course, that people have more confidence in the appeal and review process now that it's independent of the force. So perhaps we're having people who wouldn't previously have put in a review, put in a review. So I think that's encouraging um, as well. We've been um, undertaking additional work with the force to make sure the new processes are built into the governance um, and these uh, matters are reported to the, the legitimacy board which the PCC is represented on and is chaired by the chief constable um, and just while I'm on this to say that uh, it's available online the former uh, under the former regulations the last pack from the IOPC has been published in complaints data and how the force are dealing and some really encouraging data under that old system so it remains to be seen what what happens now the new regulations are in but the force had really good statistics in terms of the complaint rates uh, per, per thousand staff, which is lower than national average, and also the timeliness in dealing with complaints recording and uh, responding, which was quite considerably above the national average. So uh, to, for those interested in, in the complaints uh, uh, world as I am, I do recommend having a look at those. There's some really good performance in the force as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Adam. Um, really uh, interesting work, and uh, we will continue to update the panel on that. Uh, and then um, in this pillar, regular blogs and messaging on the COVID response. And um, you know, remembering that this is the summer period uh, when we had the famous um, Bournemouth Beach lockdown, when we had the Lulworth Cove tomb stoning, um, uh, we were regularly in the news for the wrong reasons um, over the lockdown period. And um, there was a lot of messaging being going on from my office and from the Chief Constable during this period. Excitingly for me, because it was uh, a personal commitment from me four years ago, it took four years to agree it. We have a memorandum of understanding now with um, Portland Port Police, which is uh, very exciting and adds to the capability of the force. Uh, and we have a new police boat, the Buccaneer, which was launched three months ago and now enables Dorset Police to go to the 12 mile limit, uh, which uh, with Brexit happening is uh, a good thing. Uh, the force was commended following an HMIC FRS inspection that found high levels of accuracy in the way crime is recorded. Um, this has been another uh, personal campaign for me for about five years ago, just before the last election. In fact, Dorset Police was really, really poor in this space uh, to the point that I started uh, sitting on the group with the Deputy Chief Constable to over oversee and scrutinise what the force was doing. And it, it's a long journey going from poor to good in this space, making sure you record everything. And we talked about it earlier when we were talking about hate crime. So it's been a long journey, but we're now there and I'm really, really pleased to report that. And uh, the panel received an update on OPTC scrutiny of the force uh, to COVID-19. Um, and we continue to provide that scrutiny, not just um, through the COVID, but also through business as usual, uh, all of the panels that we chair um, or that we run looking at stop search, looking at customer service improvement, looking at out of court disposals, um, et cetera. Um, and unfortunately, I spoke yesterday to the chair of the out of court uh, panel, so I can tell you how that's going. I didn't speak to the chair of the customer service improvement panel, so I can't update you as to what Barry would have told you. I don't know whether, um, sorry, someone's just coming back into the meeting. Uh, I don't know whether, Adam, you might have to give a quick, quick update. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. So um, the customer service improvement uh, panel has heard some really positive news over the last few sessions, and I'm, I'm sure the councillor would, would have reflected that. So performance, as we know, following the challenge of the force has um, dramatically 
improved within the um, call handling function and the times are at um, I think really um, historically good performance measures for, for answering the non-emergency calls. Uh, there was, um, and we've mentioned before at this forum, um, a uh, implementation of new software which was um, expected to uh, reduce that somewhat, but um, and, and I know we we have Steve Lyon on the, on the call, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the panel will hear next time around that although that had a small dip in performance, actually the call handling has returned with the new system to the previously very high levels by historic standards, which is um, extraordinary to, to hear. Um, a massive change in the control room and um, really, really good performance. I know the panel have been really impressed with um, with the progress which has been made in this area and uh, re answering those non-emergency calls. Thank you, Adam. Um, that is my quarterly report, Chair, subject to questions from the panel. Do you want, yeah. do you want me to, I know it's item six on the agenda, but just looking at what's happened in the last 15 minutes, COVID is inextricably linked. Would you like me to just bring in the COVID update now and then take questions, or would you want, because I can just see no. COVID's going to keep, going to keep uh, coming. If you, if you don't mind, I'll get um, Ian to run with the uh, questions on pillar four. Oh, okay. And, yep. talk, and then uh, I'll open the, any questions to the rest of the panel, and then we'll move on to uh, your verbal update on um, COVID-19, if that's uh, acceptable. Ian, please. Uh, morning. Uh, I, I think the first thing to say is, uh, is referring to Adam's uh, point about um, the force and how it deals with complaints. The time in this one is is really crucial, uh, and it is one that, I, I, unless I get this wrong, I think does lead to a lot of um, uh, uh, reviews and further complaints if timeliness is poor. So I think we should acknowledge the um, good work done by the um, force and now the PCC's office in managing the timeliness of complaints. Um, in relation to Pillar 4, I think um, I, I've got a couple of questions uh, around establishment, but I'm going to leave them until we get to um, the later item, if that's OK. Um, I've got one, one actual question, which is about the force management statement. Um, obviously, that was done, it's got to be about 14, 15 months ago, I think. Does, it's just, does the force have to do an annual review of that? Or how how does that now become business as usual? Bearing in mind it was introduced to also reduce, hopefully, the amount of hours spent by the force managing um, inspections by HMI CFRS. So um, it's probably easy to bring Steve in because he, this is his area of business. But but you're right. The the idea of the FMS was to reduce the burden on forces, and in fact it has reduced the burden on forces because partly because of COVID, they've had to do remote inspections, um, but they're also now doing monthly uh, checks on us rather than annual checks. So um, I, the feedback I'm getting from the forces is less work involved. Steve, FMS, your world. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Um, absolutely agree with that. So um, force management statement is really, really useful for us uh, understanding our demand and how we uh, you know, put resources in the right places and move forward. Uh, so over the COVID period, the HMIC FRS did stop all inspection activity, said we didn't have to do returns. But as a force, we made the decision uh, that we would still continue doing that because it's really become intrinsic to our plans and how we work through it. So um, we've actually got continued up to date plans that refresh, although there'll be the yearly submissions that will go in. It's not once a year. We do a lot of work to fill that in. We're continuing that on a uh, on a monthly basis. And as um, Chief Executive explained, feeding that then through to our performance board just to make sure we've got good sight. I, so I think because obviously when, when the force management statement was sold, to forces by the HMIC, it was that it would, um, whilst there would be work through the year to provide to them, it would reduce the amount of hours that police officers and staff were being um, eaten up by having to effectively do some form of inspection work every month, uh, which, which in some cases was taking hours. Well, many yeah, hours. absolutely. And they have moved to uh, risk based inspection processes and that all forms part of it. So um, really, really useful um, uh, item that we uh, continue to use. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I, can I put in a bid um, when we get to questions? Generally, I've got a couple, but I'll wait to get called. OK, just for members of the public, uh, you've heard people talking about the force management statement there. This is the force management statement. 
Um, and it's a comprehensive document, which I'm not going to bore you with, but um, it is uh, a useful tool to identify uh, police demand and how it's, how it's managed. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to go through the panel uh, name by name uh, to see if any of the panel members have got any questions that they'd like to raise based on the whole of the uh, quarter two report that uh, Martin has just uh, over got overseen. So I'm going to start with David Taylor. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, one important thing is that, I've, as you know, I've just joined panel uh, Pillar 3 uh, with May, and the main reason why I really wanted to be there was because I actually sit on the Foster Selection Committee for Dorset for recruiting uh, foster carers and placing uh, children in families. And one thing we found out going on, because we're doing depth reports of the people to make sure we have, a, we have a safe person, shall we say, to actually look after a child. And time and time again, we come up with historical sexual abuse cases coming through. Now, I don't know whether or not you've linked up with, with police crime to link up with the foster selection committee or various pieces of counsel to so that we can channel the information through to you or be, be made known to you that we can actually have it investigated. Is that of any help to you? Uh, it, it's operational. Um, uh, I'll bring Steve in on this, please. Uh, in fact, Simon's just coming in. Thank you. Um, I think it would definitely be useful. I think um, any opportunity we've got to um, to to build um, our knowledge and our understanding of the investigative process, then I think that's the opportunity to do so. Is there a um, is there a police member on that panel? We have Lado, which is which is an instructor, okay. and complaints come through, it goes automatically to the police police area. So we do have contact. It's just okay. when we discover them, it's hidden cases. It really surprises us that they've been left alone, shall we say? Yeah. I think definitely if you raise those through those through the existing channels and they will definitely get um, might go through to the right people within Dorset Police. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. It's really useful to raise. Thanks, David. Uh, Sherry Jesperson. Uh, no questions from me at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lisa Northover. No further questions from me. Thank you. Um, Rachel, I'm not sure if you're here. No. Uh, Ian. Uh, yeah, I've got, I've got uh, one in each pillar, actually, if that's all right. So, Martin, do you want to um, do them one pillar at a time or have all three together and then do them in one go? Uh, do them one at a time. OK, pillar one then. Um, one's an observation, one's a question. It, it just follows up from the um, question, I think, from Lisa around uh, the, the difference between incidents and crimes. I, I think from the panel's point of view, as I understand it, the HMIC assessment of how you recall crime as being good and you've been commended for that as well and we should take um, a positive um, feeling from that and we should note that the HMIC will tell you if you're failing as they've just done in Greater Manchester today where they've discovered they've most probably under recorded by 80,000 crimes so I think there's a sort of an observation that we can take some comfort from that it was an observation my question is um, are the use of PPNs affecting positively the, repeat, the rate of repeat incidents or repeat crimes? So um, I'm going to bring Steve in again. So the, uh, the comfort bit I would reinforce because um, I have been uh, in this space, you know, intrusively for four or five years <clears> now. <throat> and to get a good from HMIC, um, I can't remember the exact stat, it's a 94%, I think, that you have to get to uh, achieve that grade. Um, and they dip check any random crime in a year, and we have over 40,000 crimes. So it is a really high benchmark. And you're right, um, I, the force and I have worked hard to get that. Uh, and it can give you comfort that crimes are being investigated properly. Um, in relation to your second question, I'm going to bring Steve back in. Um, I mean, I could answer it. My own gut feeling um, is that PPNs are helping uh, detect crime because they're raising risk uh, and management of risk. Um, but let's see what Steve says. Yeah, absolutely. So Commissioner's right in regard to that. So the important part of the uh, the, the PPN process is that uh, engages the partnership activity as well. It assesses the risk. Uh, and uh, makes uh, all the partners aware of it and talking together about it. So as a result of that, that, that brings in the reduction of uh, 
those uh, and probably those that uh, are most at risk and most vulnerable. So uh, absolutely, I, I haven't got the exact numbers in front of me, I'm afraid to say how much of an impact that's had from there. Um, but that is the direction without a doubt. And um, just to add to what the Commission has said around that first point, uh, the reason why we recognise it's so important to get uh, really good crime data integrity is that there's victims at the end of that and we never want to miss a victim. Okay, uh, then pillar two then is, um, uh, in relation to burglary, it's just an observation, it, it, is, is, is it part of it is because of the definition of burglary other as I understand it, um, a lot of those offences would involve visitors or staff within premises, business premises. And as they're closed, I, I assume that has just had is, is part of that effect of reducing burglary other. Yeah, it is. But of course, um, I'm not sure if we've told the panel, but the, the way you report burglary changed about 18 months ago. So um, and I remember when I was told this was coming in, I thought, oh, my God, um, because in the old days, going back two, three years, if your shed was broken into in the curtilage of your garden, that was a burglary OTD other than dwelling. Um, and if your house is burgled where you live, that was a burglary dwelling. Um, the rules have changed. So if anything is stolen from the curtilage of your garden, so in my case, my chicken run, uh, my three garden sheds, um, that is recorded as a burglary dwelling. And that, that did skew the figures for a long time. And, and I was really worried about the public getting the wrong message that burglary dwelling was increasing. So you're right, burglary OTD in this world, uh, in the last 18 months, that is mainly commercial premises. OK, um, and then pillar three, um, I, I, again, it's just uh, I don't know whether it's made my misunderstanding, but in relation to serious sexual offences. Is it that one of the reasons there's been a, the marked decrease is that the issues over historical crimes being reported has now plateaued and that massive peak that we saw across the country has, has now concluded a lot of the historical issues. So it's not, again, it, it, it's just my understanding of how and why that has decreased so much. So, so I'm going to bring Steve in because this is, um, I need his operational knowledge, but I, I actually, I usually I'll disagree with you. Let's see what Steve says. But my view is that historical allegations are still coming through. They're not, not as much as the peak, as the Savile effect, as you call it. Um, but if, let's just look, look at what Councillor Taylor said. Uh, even in, in his uh, fostering uh, council, yeah. they're, they're finding uh, historical abuse cases. I think it's more about the nine time economy shutting down for nine months. Most, but a lot of serious sexual offences, sadly, are committed by acquaintances or people who, who aren't known rather than a partner. Steve, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, we all know that there was a huge amount of historical reporting that, although it has started to come down, the Commission is right, we still do get historical reports that come into the organisation. Um, I think uh, there's a, a number of different factors that uh, come into this that you kind of brand under some of the COVID effect uh, uh, as well to that. So as much as there's lots happening in the background to safeguard the vulnerable, uh, make sure that those that have been uh, uh, had repeated uh, sexual violence against them uh, are being safeguarded, um, during these particular periods here, it does look very different. So yes, the nighttime economy, I wouldn't want us to think that the whole thing is related to the nighttime economy. I think that wouldn't be fair <coughs> for me to make that assertion. But um, we did think that there might be an increase in serious sexual assaults because people are uh, staying in the house during lockdown together. Um, part of what we're seeing is that's not necessarily the case because there are others, of course, that are at home and neighbours, other family members at home as well, which has stopped those things that are, are happening. So it's a very complex picture that kind of uh, amounts to that reduction. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Chair. And um, uh, and from Barry, thank you for the update from uh, Adam. Yep, thank you for that. Um, and then, uh, sorry, moving on to May. May Haynes. If you have any questions, May. Nothing further from me, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Les, let's try. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I've got three things. Um, pillar three, Action Commitment 105, please. Um, really believe in restorative justice. I think it's an excellent tool for positive outcomes. Um, where are we actually with that? Because it's amber, at the, uh, yellow at the moment. Where are we going and what are the holdups on that one, please? I have two more questions after that. Uh, OK, so we had to, um, our provider thought uh, has changed, um, which is why it was amber. Um, oh, sorry, I do apologise, that's my dog. <laughs> um, 
the the service ha we've we've recommissioned the service and we've been more um what's the word we're trying so, to increase our referrals um and, can and I help the, you? yeah i'll bring you in action but um we have recommissioned the service we are trying to get more uh, work and while you take over adam i'm going to get rid of a dog <laughs> <laughs> not literally i hope uh, yeah, so uh, with with the restorative uh, Dorset, and you may re remember Council of Friday, this is fairly pioneering when it was brought in in Dorset. We were um, one of the sort of front of the pack, and it it was it was labelled as a as a as a pilot, which has been running for a couple of years. And it's only right now that we take it out of pilot stage and go for a proper commissioning, a fair commissioning process. And the chief executive Simon mentioned all of the uh, various rules and regulations we need to follow with um, Southwest procurement to make sure that's done properly and transparently. Um, so um, we have a service which is in, in place and a contract which um, is continues to the summer and can be extended should we need it. But where we are currently is we've produced specification for, for the um, service and we want to refine that, improve it, make some adjustments what we've learned as we've, as we've gone along. Uh, and that should be ho hopefully going out to market any, any day soon um, now. And um, uh, hopefully we'll have um, a nice competitive process of, uh, of uh, organisations bidding in for um, for that service in the future, um, but the the intention is very much to to to, to work out um, well how can we expand this and how do we bring greater awareness um, to the service to people because one of the difficulties we have is in getting referrals and also people knowing that it's something that can be done. Um, so uh, we are um, really confident that we will have that um, done in a timely fashion before the summer. But we also have um, a way of extending the contract if there's any hold up, but it's actually going exactly as we would anticipate in the timescales that we, we set. Thank you, Adam. And, um, for me, that, that's this is where, for the other man, pa, members of the panel, this is where appropriate crimes are risk assessed and victim meets perpetrator, and they sit down and discuss the implications and outcomes and that. And, and, and I have, I'm aware of some very, very powerful messages from this scheme. So it's really a good, a good thing of, of changing the behaviour of some people. But thank you for that, Adam. Um, question two, pillar four. Um, Commitment 45, reduced the police carbon footprint. You've classed that as green, but I'm sure there's a lot more that could be done on that one. I mean, you could sell one diesel car and reduce it and call it green, but there's a lot more. Where, where are we, for example, with electric cars, even changing to petrol or putting charging points in, things like that? OK, so um, I'll bring uh, Simon in in a moment on this one. But um, you're right, um, in the light of what we've seen with COVID, uh, and um, how we've stopped pollution uh, across our country by over 20 percent just by bringing people into lockdown. It, it's hard to argue we're green in this space now um, because the whole agenda has moved forward very rapidly in six months. Um, we have now got charging points in all our uh, main stations. Uh, we are increasing our fleet to be electric. And as you know, because I've already told the panel, we have um, solar panels on uh, some of our police stations now, but there's still more to be done and I will bring Simon in. But just before I do, Les, going back to your reducing reoffending uh, and restorative justice, the one area that um, I'm like you, I am passionate about this space, uh, but the, the bit I'm really passionate about is the prison restorative justice. And that took a massive hit with COVID. Um, and we just couldn't get into the prisons for victims to meet offenders for over six months, which I found very frustrating. Simon, could you just come in on the carbon footprint, please? Uh, yes, happy to, Commissioner. Um, so there's a there's a couple of things that we can do in this space, largely around our estates and our fleets. So our estates are more tricky. Um, Councillor Fry, you will know that um, a couple of our large pieces of estate are PFI buildings, so that they, we don't own them. So it's difficult to actually, um, but they are new buildings and they are energy efficient. Uh, the main difficulty we have is headquarters, which, as you will know, is a, is a large building. Um, it's also fairly out of date, um, but we're looking at options around that. Um, we've, we've got some some uh, irons in the fire with regards to what we can and can't do with regards to the replacement of that building. And obviously, if we move forward with that, we'll be looking to do so on a fully sustainable and environmental friendly basis. Um, with regards to our fleet, um, that's been we've had some good forward progress. Um, so over the summer, we um, we trialled a small number of um, the um, BMW i3 vehicles. Um, we managed to, as the commissioner said, install uh, charging points in um, stations, including HQ, um, and that was a successful trial. 
And those vehicles have now been brought onto the fleet and they are available as part of our car booking system. Uh, so they're available on the um, on the, the fleet for, um, for, for, uh, for officers and staff to, to use as needed. Um, one of the, the interesting things that we um, have come up against though with regards to trying to expand that scheme is the complexity of the various different charging points that are on the market. So um, we're going with you know, a particular manufacturer. Um, we, we, we're trying to see if Devon and Cornwall can do the same thing and we are, so at least we, if someone has to drive to um, our, our Alliance force, they can charge up when they get there. Um, we're seeing now if we can expand that to the region um, the difficulty is, though, that we're trying to have conversations about what the best way forward is, what um, vehicle manufacturer we should go with, what, um, what charging scheme we should go on. That is quite difficult, and we're seeing if that can be aligned nationally, because obviously if policing has the opportunity to procure from one or two manufacturers but have an interoperable system of charging across the entire policing network, that would be significantly more efficient. So um, we are slightly limited by and um, we would we'd want to go further in this space but at the moment we're just waiting to see if some national work can be undertaken to help us make those procurement decisions so i mean thank you very much and commissioner on that one i think this is sort of a beta vhf issue going on with a lot of the charging technology isn't it and i think we need guidance there. so in with with what you've said and there's an awful lot in there do you think the green grading is appropriate i think um could we could we do more yes of course we could do more and that's always going to be the case so where we are, um, it's it's it's. Um, I think from from my perspective, it's a question of um, have we been ambitious enough? I think we have, but we are limited, and it comes down to unfortunately, it comes down to finances. So um, would we like to be able to um, to to change all our you know to have a, a rain recovery a rainwater recovery system at Police HQ? Yes. Or do we like to put solar panels on the on police HQ? Yes, but unfortunately, we look at the cost benefits of that, um, and you know it's difficult to prioritise that particular spend in the particular environment. So, um, are we as green as we would like to be? No, um, but unfortunately, these things do come at a cost. The ambition is there, though. Um, and we're certainly going to uh, happy that we are exploring every opportunity that we've got the ability to do at this precise moment in time. Thanks, Simon. Uh, uh, Lois, if I could just come in on that. Um, what, one thing Simon hasn't said is we're green against what I pledged. Um, and four years is a long time. And four years ago, I said we're going to go solar panels, we're going to go electric vehicles, we're going to go charging point. And I listed about eight things we were going to do, and we have done those eight things. But your challenge is a really fair challenge. Um, I will take it offline, but actually arguably that we should be amber because things that's, have changed dramatically in four years. And that's but, my point. But, I congratulate what you have done, but with this, in the current time, there's always more we can do or we would like to do, and, but restrictions that come in our place. But There are. And uh, uh, the other thing Simon hasn't mentioned is, is the um, leader by a um, country mile. Uh, in this space nationally is Gloucestershire in our region. Uh, he's now converted over 20% of his police fleet to electric. Um, and we are looking at Gloucestershire and learning from what they've done. Uh, and we're very lucky to have the vanguard of uh, green, if you like, in vehicles uh, in our region. Thank you. For, um, one final point though, that you, the, congratulations on the crime recording, because it is always, if you've got integrity in your crime figures, then you can go a long way and you can stand up and, and show. Does this mean though, that this potentially is the last change of crime figures? Because every time we change our crime recording, we make it more complicated to manage performance because you've got different parameters to work with over historical figures. Well, yes, but, but as you know, because of your previous career, um, the Home Office counting rules are set by the government, by Home Office actually, uh, not by us. And um, I get really frustrated when, at a stroke of the pen effectively, we end up with uh, a new set of counting rules, which means historical baselining is really difficult. And a good example is the one I've just given you about burglary. Yeah. How can we compare our burglary light by light 10 years ago to the fertilage of your garden? Um, and I don't, I'll be honest with you, I don't understand that. Um, I do not see how a theft from a shed is a burglary dwelling. No, I agree. There you are. 
So um, we don't set the rules, unfortunately, they do. Happy to bring Steve in if you want an extra view. No, I'm, I'm happy with that. That's really helpful. And thank you for the Commissioner. Um, that's all my questions, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Les. George? Thank you, Chair. No questions at this time. Thanks. Very kind of you, Bobby. Hi, thank you. Um, if I look this way, it's because I'm using a second screen, so um, apologies for that. I just wanted to start off to say well done for the Diversity Award and also the work for Safer Streets and Boscombe and Pokes down. Very welcome. And um, I think due credit, it, it wasn't easy, but thank you very much for um, doing that and well done. Um, I have a few questions. My first is around recorded hate crime. I just wondered if there was um, a breakdown in terms of the three areas, which I believe are disability, race and sexuality, if there's trends in any one area, um, or are we reporting them and looking at them as a, an entire cohort? And then the follow on to that would be in terms of removing the barriers. Is that reducing removing barriers to reporting, I'm um, presumably, and are we again um, putting them all in one cohort? Or are we looking at different measures for each for each um, area? And again, the measures of success and what success looks like in terms of targets so that we can get that green. OK, thank you for that. Um, so uh, we are looking at the overall cohort there um, of the six uh, characteristics. Um, and um, let's face it, we're never going to be perfect in this space, are we? Because we can never do enough to stop hate crime. Uh, it is a horrendous offence. Um, so I'm going to bring Steve in because you're asking me about the, the, the subcategories. Uh, I can answer the disability one, I can't answer the other two. So I'm going to bring Steve in just to see if we've got spikes in those areas. Before I bring him in, just to say, um, and, and we, we haven't really talked about COVID yet, but you haven't just got COVID in relation to hate crime, you've got Brexit too. And, um, you know, I'm nervous about next month because uh, we saw a massive spike uh, in 2016. And when Brexit happens and things start going wrong, which they probably will, um, I, I do worry about uh, the response of the public in the hate crime space. Steve. Thank you, Commissioner. So uh, as, um, as as has just been said, uh, yes, we uh, that is overall reporting. Yes, we can break that down into different um, characteristics uh, to give some reassurance. Um, every single uh, our computer systems, we've got a way of uh, uh, getting notified of every single one of those and we review every single one of those in some detail. We've got a strategic lead that looks at this uh, and takes it into prejudice free Dorset. So I don't have the exact stats directly in front of me. We can get that information uh, and bring it forward offline council if that would be of assistance to you. But that reassurance that we do understand what sits behind that uh, and it does go into that partnership group uh, to respond to it. I mean, no, that's fine. That, sorry, Martin. I'll let you well, I think Simon was asking to come in. This is an area he's very knowledgeable in. So but his hands come back down. So. Um, I was going to say I, I'm greatly reassured by that because obviously I, I'm not looking to delve into the figures, but really just to make sure that it's being looked at and if there's any risks that they that will then be picked up. So thank you. Um, in terms of sorry, I've lost where I am now. Um, in terms of explore further road safety improvements, again, I wasn't entirely sure what that meant. It's green, but how are you measuring the success of that? Can you just give me, um, hang on, Sorry, where are we? So, so into um, Pillar, working with our communities, and it is explore further road safety improvements. Um, okay, so, action plan, page 17, yeah? Got it. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it sounds like, uh, I'm repeating myself, but it's very similar to the uh, one about the green. Um, when, uh, because these are, I'm being judged here on stuff that I pledged four years ago, as you know. And four years ago, I said that we would look at um, bringing in average speed cameras, that we would digitalise the fixed camera sites um, at a cost of a million pounds, um, that we would uh, explore uh, alternative and better versions of the driver safety awareness scheme, which we now have. We, we are leading the country. We have. Um, an hour long, no more than that actually, a two hour long webinar uh, of road safety initiatives uh, so that we don't have to put people into a classroom. So all those three things I've achieved, which is why I'm green. But actually there's always so much more we could do. And you know, Bobby, because I've been passionate about this for years. 
I'm never be happy in the road safety space while we have a different drink drive limit to the rest of Europe. I totally and utterly disagree with that. I've lobbied against that to five different transport ministers uh, and I just cannot get people to do what the Scottish have done, which is bring it down to the European level. So there are lots of things in this space that I'd rather uh, improve on. Our KSIs I can never be complacent on. Um, but, but to be fair, and I'm not being defensive, I'm just saying we're green because I've achieved what I said I'd achieve. Then that's fine. I just didn't understand it in that context. Talking of context, um, on that same page, 113, work with partners to reduce disproportionality. I almost feel like there's a couple of words um, missing from the end of that sentence. I'm not entirely sure what that means. <laughs> OK, so uh, um, this is the Achilles heel for Dorset Police. Uh, uh, this is the disproportionality issues that we are facing with stop and search. Right, okay. um, that, that's what this is about. Um, and uh, we've already reported on that in the last panel. Um, Happy to bring Simon in if you want to hear from him or. Um, no, I just didn't know what it was in relation to. I could make that assumption. I just wanted to make sure that's um, what you were referring to because it just. Well, to, to, be fair, to be fair, we need to reduce disproportionality across the piece, don't we? Um, but actually, and I do regularly check as police crime commissioner, we're not disproportionate with Taser. We're not disproportionate with COVID tickets. We are really disproportionate stop search. And that's what actually that pledge was about. Thank you. And um, Les has um, picked up all the points regarding climate, carbon footprints, uh, funding and resources. I've just saw it. It's on my phone because I only saw it this morning. So it may be too soon to talk about it. Um, it announced, and I'm very welcome at this announcement, that police officers on maternity and adoption leave are to receive full pay for 26 weeks, which will increase from the 18 weeks. I just wondered what that does to your budget and how um, or basically how you've mitigated for it. W were you aware this was coming? Have you oh, well, just basically it's it's so new. It's really welcome. But how are you dealing with it? What does it do for our finances? What does it do for our resources? OK, so um, I am cited on this. Lucy Dorsey, uh, DAC and the Met um, about to become the chief constable of the British Transport Police is the lead in this area and has campaigned now, uh, as you probably know, for three years to get this um, maternity leave approved uh, for all police staff. Um, and she has succeeded uh, two weeks ago in achieving that. Uh, and the ministers have now com committed to it, so have the Treasury. Um, I'll bring Julie in to see what the impact is. But to be honest, it's going to be quite small. Um, I think across the whole organisation, we've probably got 50 or less staff on maternity leave at any one time. Let's see what Julie says. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I, I don't have to hand the, the exact numbers, but certainly it will all be factored into next year's budget, obviously, as we build that up through. Um, but I, I can I can let you have the numbers um, outside of the meeting, but I don't have them to hand at the minute. If the impact is small and there's no risk to our ongoing budgets, um, then then I'm, I'm satisfied. Again, it's just looking at the risk and having an oversight, isn't it? But um, thank you. Um, that's my questions. Thank you, panel, and thank you, Commissioner, for, for that uh, report uh, and the questions. Um, most of the questions that I, I had, um, I've either been asked or I'm also conscious of time. Uh, but there is one that I would like to ask, and it's in the transformation area. Um, a lot of work was done a couple of years ago uh, on the Alliance, a number of business cases, 30 plus business cases, all of which uh, were going, I'm going to use the wrong, probably the wrong word here, promised uh, savings in the future. Where are we in, in, in ensuring that these savings are being met or found? OK, so some of this was dealt with by Simon earlier. Um, we, as you say, 32 business cases. Uh, and have has things changed in the last two years? Yes, there have been two of those business cases that we are looking at decoupling um, and actually we have now brought in quite a, a, an aggressive regime to make sure that we're still receiving the savings that we were promised. Um, I'm not in a position to give that to you today. Uh, we had a meeting last week. I will be in a position to give it to you at the next panel meeting, hopefully. Um, so I'm reasonably reassured that, that those continued savings are, are coming. Um, but of course, uh, as we settled down and realised we weren't going to merge, some of the business cases had to be re-evaluated and indeed 
decoupled, one of those is the prevention department. Um, but actually, we're still steaming ahead. The alliance is strong and all police fire commissioners and chief constables are committed to it. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you for that. I think it would be uh, prudent to, uh, when you do the budget presentation, um, to bring forward the actual savings that you have managed to achieve um, over the uh, through 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 the alliance, is that uh, is that acceptable? Uh, it is, and actually, Julie's going to touch on that in her PowerPoint. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, which leads us nicely into uh, some finance questions, if you don't mind. Um, what changes have there been uh, since the 1920 Treasury Management and Investment Strategy with respect to the uh, PCC's cash flows, borrowing, and investments? And all the associated risks. Uh, I'll bring Julian for that, please. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, in in terms of cash flow, the biggest impact um, for us was in quarter one, so between April and June, um, and that was when we switched to paying for buyers uh, immediately uh, following the government directive. That that had an, an, a negative impact. Um, and did result in us having to undertake some additional temporary borrowing, um, particularly at the um, end of the months of May and June. Um, that returned to normal patterns from July as, as that kind of bringing forward of payments evened itself out. Um, so, but it does mean that we continue to fund borrowing for the capital programme from those internal resources. So we, we haven't taken on any external long term borrowing um, in relation to that. Um, originally, during the year, we planned to undertake some longer term investments. Um, however, the impact of the pandemic on uh, markets and, and other investments meant that this wasn't appropriate um, up to date. So um, that has been delayed and the, it was just felt that the risks of all of the um, volatility just, just weren't appropriate to undertake those investments. So they have been delayed, um, still, on, still on the um, agenda going forward. Um, but keeping that um, in mind. Um, but the biggest risk we face this year has been in relation to uh, negative interest rates. So although the, the bank rate is, isn't negative, um, the debt management office did move into a negative rate space and is still in that space for overnight investments. We were um, using that facility at the peak of our cash flow um, over the summer. Um, so when those negative rates came in um, in September, we did change our treasury management strategy, which allowed us to um, increase our investments in individual money market funds um, uh, to avoid making uh, those investments at negative interest rates and paying for, for someone to invest our money, um, but still maintaining sufficient diversity in the portfolio to balance out um, that, that kind of credit risk. Um, so we did make some slight changes. It has meant that we avoided negative interest rates, um, but it, it has been a challenge. But th those um, changes to the strategy were reviewed only this week, are working well um, and, and will feed into next year's strategy as well. So have you updated it for 2021? Um, we're in the process of doing the 2021 strategy. We, we, we did update the 1920 strategy um just with those tweaks in during the year so that was done um at the beginning of october okay could you make sure that goes online please yes yeah we'll do thank you because uh, interestingly the borrowing that you were projecting in uh 1920 i think almost by accident is almost spot on what you were project projecting yes yes yeah um talking of which um borrowing what is the annual cost of, of debt and how is it being funded OK, so there's, there's two elements to the cost of debt. Excluding PFI, obviously. Yes, yeah. Um, it, that are both funded from the revenue budget. So they're, they're built into the budget um, and, and are funded as part of that. Um, one is uh, what is referred to as the minimum revenue provision within public, um, public finance. And the other is, is the interest charge. So the minimum revenue provision is is, is similar to a principal repayment of the loan, um, but it's linked to the life of the asset, not the life of length of the loan and the actual principal repayment. So um, we have to charge that that fee to the revenue budget, regardless of, of whether there, there is an actual loan. Um, so 
um, for example, if you borrowed for um, an asset that was a million pounds and it was had a life of uh, 10 years, then the charge would be a hundred thousand pounds for the year, irrespective of whether you borrowed for five years, 10 years, 40 years. Um, so the cost, the total cost of minimum revenue provision in uh, the current financial year is um, 110,000. That's slightly under budget. Um, we originally estimated to be 123,000, but right at the end of the year, we, we um, financed some assets. So, so can we just confirm that the annual debt, cost of debt is about 100, 120K? Um, yeah, currently. Okay, it, interest is that's a lot fine. lower. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you. Um, and, and coming back to the report, uh, the course two report, um, it, it's noticeable that the payment and employment costs um, were were favourable uh, for quarter one, uh, and they've changed by 964k in in this quarter. I suppose the question really is why is this why is this not being more effectively managed uh, and programmed? Because that's a considerable change. Okay, so there's, there's a number of factors that are affecting that that forecast. One was um, a specific decision that was made in quarter two to um, a, a kind of accelerate the recruitment of our uh, new opli uh, operation uplift officers, um, particularly in the September intake, to ensure that we made sure that we we achieved the, the 50 additional officers by the end of March. So, so we made a, a deliberate decision to over recruit. Um, yes, that it does um, provide financial pressure during this financial year. Um, mm -hmm. But it also means that those officers are um, within the force earlier. They're able to be deployed um, earlier um, to support um, Dorset citizens at, at an earlier stage. So that was a deli deliberate uh, decision. So that, that's part of the, the reason. Um, we've had some uh, more major operations than we um, were anticipating during the quarter. Um, and we have agreed um, in the uh, October budget monitoring position that was considered last week to use some of the major operations reserved to fund that. Um, and, but we've also seen a reduction in the number of police officers on extended leave breaks, which are unpaid, um, and a reduction in the uh, police staff turnover. So um, as a result of the pandemic and, and the economic climate, people are are not um, leaving as much as we anticipated. So whilst that's positive in that we retain uh, those experience and knowledge and skills, um, it has placed an additional pressure on that budget, which is materialised during quarter two. OK, thank you for that. Very, that's uh, nice and clear. Thank you. Um, I suppose the, the only thing that uh, I would, uh, would stress is that you do have reserves. Uh, you've got a reserve uplift of some 200k um yeah, it's still there and um the other area also is that we we sort of touched on where you are as far as um overall spend is concerned in the year to date yes um so uh as at uh, the 30th of september uh the, the prediction was 1.3 million overspent and we'd spent about 69 and a half million pounds um up to that point so, and the, uh, just remind me what the overall budget is again. Uh, the overall budget is uh, 141.6 million pounds. So you're on schedule then, are you not? A half year point. In fact, you're on the schedule. Just on. Uh, but that that's the timing. The the kind of looking at what the forecast is. There's, yeah. there's it's expected to. Um, but it's not, it's not necessarily the bleak picture that that. Uh, we've been possibly led to believe uh, certainly that um that position the concern was that that position would materialize if action wasn't taken oh. um, but but the november the october position that we considered last month did show significant progress and we're back down towards the uh, quarter one position of about 645 yeah as a, lay, a layman's swag you're just under half budget halfway through the year so well that's that's good yeah, OK, thank you very much for that. Um, thanks, Julie. Uh, moving on then to item six, COVID-19 verbal update, please. Martin. Thank you, Chair. 
<clears throat> um, so if I can start by reminding members that um, this is a different update to normal because I'm talking um, about our latest position, position, position rather than historic one. Um, and normally I talk about things that have happened in the past, like quarter two. Um, so it's also quite operational. So I'd like to remind members that whilst I'm happy to pass on an overview of force activity, I'm not in a position to offer further details. Um, so Chair, following on from the verbal update I provided in late September, the position in terms of the activity undertaken by myself and my office in relation to COVID-19 is largely unchanged. Um, last time I explained that the Strategic Coordination Group, the SCG, chaired by the Chief Constable um, and Simon on my behalf attends that, uh, has overall responsibility for the Dorset multi-agency response to the pandemic and that it has now returned to bi-weekly meetings and that position is still true. Uh, however, in recent weeks, additional subgroups have been stood up within the SCG to support the Health Protection Board, which focuses on testing and vaccination. Uh, and we, of course, all know that Dorset County Hospital <coughs> is one of the 53 NHS sites chosen by the government to receive the, va the vaccine as the rollout is set to um, begin. Um, and that our residents will benefit from a regional mass vaccination centre being set up in the BIC. Um, I want to take this opportunity to place on record my heartfelt thanks to everyone who continues to work incredibly hard to minimise the impact of this horrible uh, virus on our local communities. And it's only with their tireless efforts that we have collectively managed to keep uh, our incredibly hard pressed frontline services intact and still delivering their critical support to our communities. Uh, and Adam will talk about the impact on wellbeing uh, in a later paper. Uh, COVID operations on the Dorset Police side, their COVID Gold Group continues, which is responsible for directing the force's operational response to the pandemic. The OPCC does not have direct oversight of the operational group, but I do receive weekly updates from the command team. As, a, as an example of the kinds of operational matters that are discussed with me, my chief executive and I recently had a conversation with the chief and deputy chief constable about the government decision to make illegal any protests or marches of over 30 people through changes to the coronavirus legislation. We talked through the national standing guidelines around the four E's approach of engage, explain, encourage and enforce when necessary. And we recognise the need to enforce this temporary change in legislation as it only applied during the second lockdown period. And we recognise that the demand placed on Dorset Police due to protests would not necessarily compare to other force areas. And we considered the impact of the local population um, on of such protests and whether local communities would be directly involved. Um, and obviously most of those uh, happened in the conurbation, as you know. We also talked through potential impacts on public confidence in the police and the potential impact of force reputation um, of enforcing the new legislation. The Chief Constable and I also discussed this necessary change in policing approach with our MPs and local authority leaders and chief execs. And as you know, this ultimately ended with Dorset Police taking a robust approach to protests during the lockdown period over two different weekends and making several arrests. Surge funding, I want to update you on the Chief Constable's use of the government surge funding. I talked about this earlier in this meeting. Um, we now have some funding to enforce COVID enforcement. Uh, you get ring fenced funds from the Home Office, which should be solely used, uh, and I quote, to fund COVID-19 surge capacity through increased overtime or any other suitable workforce related measure. And we received just under a quarter of a million pounds. So Dorset Police uses this surge fund to provide for three double crew cars with an, an additional car covering Friday and Saturday late shifts for a period of four months. And this goes back to the point I made earlier, which is with three or four COVID related cars touring the county, it does allow policing to do business as usual outside of that. I won't go into the operational specifics, but rest assured the forces deployment plan for these additional patrols, which I have seen has been designed to ensure that areas of high demand are covered during high peak periods. And this also dovetails with the overall operational policing response to the public health emergency operation to two. My office has also considered the detail of this operational order, including the costs and community impact, and I have confidence in the proposed use of that funding. Uh, 
Uh, domestic abuse, finally, um, well, and we have talked about this twice already in this meeting. I understand that members have asked about the impact on domestic abuse within Dorset. I can report, as noted in the report we've already mentioned, that um, the number of domestic abuse crimes in, to Dorset Police has reduced very slightly compared year on year. Uh, and um, I covered this issue in the previous item, so I won't repeat myself. But you would also have been briefed on the DA awareness raising campaign I supported at the beginning of lockdown. So to reconfirm some of that activity, victims of Dorset continue to have access to victim support 24-7 live chat service. And that runs alongside the national support line and is managed centrally. And I receive bi-weekly updates from victim support and have maintained careful and close contact through the period of the pandemic. We've worked very closely with charities providing domestic violence services during lockdown. And this includes making sure there's been enough accommodation for those fleeing violence to refugees or the like, and for those children and young people who've been affected by DA. And we funded a range of awareness uh, raising initiatives, including an animated advisory message across social media and printing information where to get domestic abuse support on prescription bags that were used by pharmacies across Dorset. I continue to have confidence in the provision of these services, as well as with our domestic violence preventive prevention work. So related to this and thinking about the continuation of services to support vulnerable people, more broadly since my last update to the panel, I just wanted to highlight two final areas of my office's work. Firstly, hot off the press, my office has just been successful in being awarded a further £77,000 from the MOJ to support victims' charities during the pandemic period. And in this case, they will be able to, to allow us to keep enhanced services running until March 2021. And I'd like to highlight the work of my commissioning manager, Lewis Gould, in helping us achieve this. Uh, typically, without sounding ungrateful, MOJ funding requests have been received by my office at the last minute, within the 11th hour, and are quite tightly ring-fenced uh, for specific purposes. So the significant amount of work was done by Lewis and the team at very short notice to get that £77,000, and I'm very grateful to him and the team. And finally, I'm very proud of the volunteers within uh, OPCC who continue to help me offer support and scrutiny to Dorset Police during the pandemic by their attendance at our various scrutiny panels. And as the chair of ICFA, a special mention should go to our independent custody visitors, who was written to by the Chief Constable actually this week, saying thank you for all the amazing work you've done, uh, uh, and who kept up custody visits right throughout both lockdowns. Chair, I hope I've addressed the key issues of inquiry, but welcome any further comments members may have on the activity of myself and my office. Well, thank you very much for that, and also congratulations on your office in get, achieving that uh, 77k grant. Um, that's uh, most most welcome. Um, I'm going to go through uh, the panel, um, panel by name now. Um, Bobby Duff. Do you have any questions? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, George. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. No questions from me, but uh, uh, my 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 thanks to the uh, to the commissioner and the uh, office of the uh, of the commissioner for um, such a comprehensive report and the uh, support given to uh, the residents and the public. Okay, thank you for that, George. Uh, Les Fry. No, nothing for me at this time. Thank you. May Haynes. May, you need to put your boom down. The surge funding, uh, and of which three extra cars will actually then uh, be, not three extra cars, but there'll be up to three cars being provided. Um, I'm particularly interested in the fact that it's actually also covered Friday and Saturday. Um, so my question is, obviously there are hotspots and we don't know whether we are actually going to be changing tier after the 16th of December. So the question to the Commissioner is, is he satisfied that the force will be agile enough that should there be a change um, when they do, the government do the review, that they'll be able to act quickly enough and uh, make plans that would then therefore be able to deal with any potential issues that could arise in areas where there will be an active nighttime economy. So as I see Simon wants to come in, I think before I bring Simon in, it depends which way we go, uh, May, because if we go to tier three, 
um, that would probably entail more enforcement. Uh, if we go to tier one, then you're, you're right, the nighttime economy comes back. Simon wants to uh, come in. Uh, thanks, Commissioner. I think the, the short answer to Councillor Haynes is, is yes. So the, the force um, Dorset Police has a weekly um, gold group on COVID. Um, so it's chaired by a senior officer. Uh, there are a number of different um, uh, in, in, with uh, uh, representation from right across the force. And they will look at the operational activity or the incoming data, the issue of um, uh, FPNs and where demand is coming from, not only policing, but from uh, local authority services as well. So I think the, the short answer is that um, Dorset Police has a really strong understanding of where demand is coming from, uh, looks at that on a weekly basis and will, um, and its operational plans are specifically designed to be flexible. Thanks, mate. Um, moving on to Ian. Nothing for me, thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Rachel, I don't think you're here yet. No. Um, Lisa? No further questions from me, thank you. Thank you. Um, Sherry? Nothing from me, thank you, Chair. David, David Taylor? Nothing from me, thank you. Excellent report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Martin, and congratulations to your, your team again on securing that, that funding. Uh, and if you could ask the, for, for, if I could ask you to pass on directly the panel's thanks to the players that secured that. Um, moving on now to item seven, review of precept activity, just as a bit of background for those that are watching in. Um, PCP, Police and Crime Panel, endorsed the PCC's proposal uh, for precept in February this year. Uh, and we subsequently wrote to the OPCC um, with a uh, comprehensive uh, list of uh, how we would want, how we would expect, how we would want um, the money to be uh, to be utilized, the additional funds to be utilized. Uh, I think it's worth noting also that a number of those uh, bullets that we put into our letter uh, also came directly from the Minister of Policing and Fire Service from his national directive when the uh, policy was released on, on funding uh, for this year. Um, so uh, the question really is what, you know, what action has been taken in order to ensure that this tax increase has been beneficial to the people of Dorset? If I can hand over to you, please, Martin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to bring Julie in and we're going to present you with some slides, which will give you a really quick um, PowerPoint uh, plan of what we've delivered uh, and how. Um, Julie. Yep, I'll just try and uh, put this, share the slides now. So they should hopefully be coming up. Can you uh, see? You yep. can see them. OK, good. Um, yep. I, OK. So um, this presentation is designed to, to give an overview of, of where we are and how the force has utilised the precept and the budget so far this year. Um, a number of the things in here have already been referred to, so I, I won't dwell on them too much to repeat what's been said already this morning. Um, but I'll also cover uh, some of the OPCC activity and there was a, speci a specific question about the capital strategy group, which I'll, I'll cover at the end. Uh, so just in terms of some background, um, the precept process, uh, as, as usual, always starts with a, a letter from the Chief Constable to the Commissioner setting out um, the setting the scene for his budget request. Um, this is an extract from the first page of that letter um, and makes it clear that the 2020-2021 precept would largely be uh, required to meet some increases in existing costs, most of which have been um, uh, outside of the force's control. So the budget was uh, considered and set in early February of this year. Um, it now seems a particularly long time ago. I'm not sure that the words COVID or pandemic really featured in our, our everyday language at that point in time, um, but it did include a £10 increase in the precept. Um, specifically uh, increasing the uh, number of officers by uh, 50, but mainly those unavoidable costs of pay and price inflation. 
but if, even though um, it, it was quite a static budget in that respect, we still managed to deliver some innovation and investment in services. In particular, um, Operation Uplift, um, we did have a target of 50 officers to be delivered by uh, 2021. And as I've already said, there's a specific decision made to um, accelerate that recruitment over recruit in the current year to make sure that we did deliver those 50 officers for the people of Dorset. Um, the recruitment continued despite the pandemic. We've had uh, intakes in both June and September so far, particularly that September intake was the one that was higher. Um, we've got further intakes planned for January and March of this year. And we're currently expected to have 64 additional offers, officers by the 31st of March. Um, as I've already said, um, that is a financial pressure, but would be funded from the grant that we receive next year, so it's only affecting this year's budget. Um, as part of that recruitment, we have seen some innovation, particularly the degree holder entry programme. This um, is a accelerated programme for those that already hold a degree, so it's a two year programme rather than three years. And Dorset is one of only 13 forces across the country that is now running this programme. We also have a detective programme um, and September saw the first cohort for, for that scheme. And again, there's uh, cohorts in January and March planned for both of those schemes. So in terms of the overall force performance, we've spoken a lot about um, the crime statistics already um, this morning, but Dorset continues to be a very safe area in which to live, work and visit. Um, a particular note is the um, uh, better than national average performance in those priority areas of violent crime and sexual offences, but also we've had successes uh, in tackling county lines, in particular during the September week of intensification, which saw nine arrests, uh, the seizure of drugs, cash and other assets, as well as vulnerable people being safeguarded. Again, we've mentioned the improvements in call handling and those set, uh, statistics there are, are, are particularly pleasing. We've also mentioned the outcome of the HMIC FRS inspection into crime data, but also the OPCC is well tied into the forces plans to achieve outstanding in managing vulnerable people in future inspections. Um, it's a clear and, and well communicated organisational goal um, and there's a detailed strategy and action plan that, that we're working with the force on. Some other in innovations and improvements we've managed to deliver. Um, Storm is the uh, command and control um, system that was referred to earlier, uh, which has been replaced. Uh, our previous fairly ancient system um, that went live in October, and as Adam referred to earlier, has only had a, a slight dip on improvements and has now recovered back to those, those previous statistics. Um, we've also uh, we repurposed Ferndown as our home of initial training to support uplift, um, particularly look at including study and breakout spaces, an upgraded gym to support the new officers' safety training. We've highlighted the work of the Bobby Van, which has made over 220 visits since its launch in January. And again, uh, the investment in the digital statement taking and signing means that we can now um, take remote statements remotely at the witness's convenience, um, which saves around two hours of officer time each statement. And given that we're now um, averaging about 850 statements a month, is a really significant uh, efficiency saving in that process. We've also um, been involved in a joint response unit with the Southwest Ambulance Service, um, which deals with those who are suffering mental health issues. Um, and ensures the best care for the individual, as well as reducing demand for, for both services. We've also uh, recruited specialist vulnerable, vulnerability lawyers. Um, they're particularly supporting investigations in obtaining protection orders and civil injunction opportunities, um, which help protect those vulnerable victims from the most serious offenders. Um, and that's things like the domestic violence um, prevention orders and stalking prevention orders. And, and finally, as already referred to, we've introduced the online driver awareness course, um, which allow, has allowed the activity to continue during the pandemic, 
um, and has also brought attention from other forces who haven't been able to um, introduce that capability. In terms of efficiency savings, we've got a good track record in delivering savings in Dorset. Since 2010, we've uh, delivered savings in excess of £42 million. Um, and procurement forms a, a really important part of that, um, not only in actually reducing the costs of the things we're actually purchasing, but also in streamlining that process to make sure that that is efficient, as efficient as possible. Um, so uh, we are using frameworks, um, in particular an example so far this year is the use of a national framework in re-procuring our, our fuel cars, uh, obviously used a, a, a streamlined process to do that, but saved £40,000 a year on terms of those new, new framework, new, new fuel cars. But also Blue Light Commercial is the uh, national procurement organisation for policing. They've been set up, they've gone live this year in order to um, produce those, those national frameworks for um, policing to use. There's been some delays in, in their work as a result of the pandemic, but they have now um, making progress on their first major piece of work, which is a vehicle framework um, for purchasing of vehicles. Um, a key area for efficiency savings is the use of technology. Um, and there, there are sort of three examples here of where we are using technology in order to deliver efficiencies. Uh, so the first is where we're looking at automating searches of different databases for information. So rather than keying that information into each individual database, we're able to key that once and then automatically search all of those databases for that information. Um, we've also introduced e-recruitment, and this has been particularly timely given the increased number of applications that we're getting for available roles. That helps um, speed up that process and deliver savings, not just for the HR teams, but also for all of those who are undertaking that recruitment. And also, as the Commissioner mentioned, rolling out digital speed enforcement cameras um, saves officer time and reduces maintenance costs. Looking quickly at um, OPCC grant funding, these are additional funding that we've generated this year. I think we've already referred to uh, both of these, the Safer Streets Fund and uh, the Ministry of Justice funding, the two, two areas that we've got there. Um, but we do continue to lobby for fairer funding for Dorset. Um, I'm aware that um, uh, the uh, West Dorset MP raised this issue in uh, the House of Commons only this month. Um, it's been impacted by, by COVID. It's uh, certainly less of a priority from uh, the Home Office side, um, but we do continue to lobby for Dorset on an ongoing basis. Um, finally, uh, just touch on the Capital Strategy Group, which is a new group that um, was set up in, in March this year to provide some additional scrutiny and challenge to the Capital Programme in particular. Now, that group is made up of people from the finance team, myself and uh, my equivalent in, within the force, but also all of the major budget holders within the capital programme. Um, we've met four times since March and um, a, a key outcome for uh, the, the group initially was about making sure that everybody understood the big picture. So they understood the impact of the capital programme on the revenue budget and not just um, their specific uh, budget and scheme. Um, I think that's been successful for me and, and an outcome of that was at the end of quarter one we had um, quite a lot of savings identified um, as well as slippage and actually the suggestion to, to bring all of those savings together to enable us to invest in, in other schemes that might come along um, was actually a suggestion by the budget holders themselves. They understood that there was potentially other need um, you don't very often get budget holders volunteer, voluntarily giving up their budget, but because of that greater understanding, that was something that they did. So that for me, was quite a positive um, outcome. It's enabled us to assess the capital programme at an early stage from the impacts of the pandemic, um, particularly looking at slippage. And we've made much earlier decisions about taking out that slippage and building it into next year's programme challenging that slippage, how is it actually going to be, um, what's the timing of that spend, and take that proactive action 
Um, hopefully that then leads to more accurate forecasting. Um, but obviously we're only part way through the year, so time will tell when we get to the year end whether that um, actually materialises. But I am hopeful and, and certainly get good engagement at those meetings. Um, it does also give us stronger challenge to the development of the budget and that process. Um, looking at next year, really, really looking at timings, getting realistic expectations of spend, realistic expectations of activity. So hopefully that the future programme, not just for next year, but the next five years, will be uh, uh, even more robust than previously. But happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that, Julie. Uh, comprehensive brief. Uh, you've nailed all the key points in the letter that we issued um, earlier this year. So thank you very much for that. Um, before I bring the panel in, um, I know that uh, Jim is our, Jim is our finance advisor from Dorset Council. Jim, would you uh, any, any points you'd like to raise or, or issues you'd like to highlight? Uh, morning again all. Julie, thanks for your presentation. No questions on the presentation as such. Um, I wondered if it was pertinent to give a quick update on where we are with the uh, council tax base setting exercise for next yes. year. Julie's nodding. Yes, please. <laughs> um, so breath, if, Jim. Bated breath. Uh, so th there's a long and a short answer. The short answer is, uh, so those of you who want to scurry off and do the calculations now, uh, we are saying no growth in the council tax base over and above 2021. The context behind that is, although when we did the data extract on the 30th of November, there has been a small increase in what we would call the gross council tax base. So there's an increase in the, the number of properties. Uh, we have um, had obviously increases in local council tax support claimants, single persons discount claimants and so on. Um, and there is also, as you'll be aware, Julie, we've been sharing information with you, not necessarily through this forum, but but outside of it, uh, of pressures on the collection fund. So the collection fund for both uh, council tax and business rates, which doesn't affect police, obviously, but affect others preceptors. Um, they're both behind where they should be in terms of their traditional performance. So um, if those things were unadjusted and prior to the spending review, we thought they might well be, we were worried about what the collection rate uh, impact would be uh, on the fund. Uh, now, we're still waiting for the details, so there is a little bit of risk involved, but we have been told that around 75% of the collection fund deficits will be supported by government. So the devil is always in the detail. We need to work out exactly what that is. But we think that uh, it effectively only means uh, a drop in the net um, multiplier from 98.5% this year to 98% next year. Year, that offsets our 0.45% growth uh, and brings us, it's actually a very, very small contraction in the council tax base. It's about 90 properties or about 0.06%. So um, to all intents and purposes, it, it's flat. The technical detail is that it's a small reduction. Julie, we can share the, the details of the spreadsheet with you. Our target to do that with towns and parishes and yourselves, obviously, uh, was the end of this week. And it'll be with you. We're just dotting the I's and crossing the T's on the briefing note for members. Uh, so uh, the, the council's own position was that we'd originally forecast uh, council tax uh, base growth of 0.75% um, and we'd revised that at the quarter one and quarter two stage after um, the impact of coronavirus on the collection funds to, to being zero. Um, so we're, we're comfortable that it is. It's difficult balance and there is risk involved in it. Julie will understand all of that kind of stuff and I, I won't bore everyone else with the details but um, we, we think we're striking the right balance between prudence and forcing people to cut back on service delivery budgets and make savings. Um, by, by setting it at 98, so a broad assumption is that it's flat. Thanks very much for that, Jim. Um, I, I, do you have any idea if that's that view, uh, those figures, whatever is mirrored mirrored within BCP? Uh, I don't know. I had asked um, a colleague just this morning, so we only had our briefing on the numbers uh, yesterday, and I've kind of reflected on that overnight. We've asked BCP if they're ready to share their figures yet. We're we're earlier than we've been before. So we've advanced our, our information that involved uh, quite a lot of work for people extracting data from, from different systems and everything. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if they're ready to go with their numbers yet, but um, I, I don't know if they fed into you directly, Julie. Um, I, th I think I think no. we're early and we're only telling you now there'll be a formal notification um, before the end of the week, but uh, I, I'm not sure where BCP are. 
Sorry about that, first one today. Uh, thank you for that, Jim, that's very kind of you. I noticed, Martin, you've got your hand up. It was just a quick question for Jim. Jim, nice to see you. Um, are you still expecting your government settlement Monday, Tuesday? Because we're expecting ours Wednesday, Thursday. Is that, is that about on track? Um, <laughs> uh, we had originally been told 17th of December. We then got some whispers that it might be 14th or 15th. Um, it, it's really anyone's guess. If we get it before the end of this week, I'll be sorry, before the end of next week, I'll be reasonably happy. As if it doesn't, if it doesn't, if it doesn't slip, the tendency, the experience of previous years is that we've had a date announced and it's it's slipped. Um, either way, it will be um, probably a pretty busy Christmas and New Year period for us. <laughs> okay, Thank you very much for that, Jim. Um, just coming back to one area of two points I want to, like to make before I open this to the panel. Um, one, um, you did mention about uh, lobbying for a fair and equal equitable equitable uh, distribution of national funds to Dorset, please. I think it is worth remembering that uh, Dorset council taxpayers for the, for the Dorset police budget pay 50% and 50% comes from, from town. Uh, other areas of the country, 70% uh, of that comes from uh, their, their local police budget comes from the town and 30% is provided uh, from local taxpayers. Um, Martin, would you like to, to voice uh, your, you've been lobbying on this for some time now. Where are you in progressing uh, some form of getting some form of equi equitable result? So uh, thank you, Chair. And um, you're right, I've been lobbying on this for eight years. Um, some of the panel who've been here a while would go, oh, he's done, he's, he's talking about that again. Um, <clears throat> You'll know that um, I've lobbied a government four or five times. You'll know, but some of the public watching may not know, that we nearly got to a new police uh, funding system uh, three years ago, which would have seen Dorset receive about three million pounds extra, which is about the amount we're underfunded um, because of the unfair rules. And that equates to 100 police officers. So uh, we got really close to the wire and then the government pulled the new um, funding scheme. Um, what are we doing now? Well, I have already uh, lobbied the policing minister on this. Um, Richard Drax is a really good ally for us in this space, and he raised this in Parliament um, only a couple of months ago, um, as has Simon Hall, who's a North Dorset MP. So we have our MPs on board that we have them raising this issue for us in Parliament. Um, I think we'll, uh, we are in extraordinary times. I think I have to be realistic. I wouldn't uh, try and approach the government and lobby for this anymore until we have resolved Brexit and we have resolved COVID, which is probably going to be this time next year. And I may not be here. Um, I just I have to respect the fact the government has got lots going on at the moment. Thank you for that. I hear that. Uh, uh, before I hand over to the panel, uh, request from me, please, Julie, that as part of the budget uh, preparations for next year, um, the elephant in the room is the capital programme. We all know that. It would be uh, advantageous if you could provide us with a robust uh, plan on how you're going to resolve uh, the planning at the capital, capital programme. Yeah, no, that's certainly the intention. Um, including you know, elements, as have been pointed out earlier on, police headquarters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We all know yeah. what the problems are. Thank you very much for that. I'm now going to hand over to the panel. Um, starting with David Taylor. Sorry, no questions. Thank you very much. Thank Sorry, you, David. Uh, Sherry Jefferson. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, a question for um, Julie, if I may. Hello, Julie. Um, you mentioned uh, one or two innovations that had come in, and some of them will be as a result of different ways of working. So you referenced e-recruitment and digital statements. Um, can we be assured that you will all be looking strenuously to carry forward these innovations for the world after COVID if they have resulted in savings without um, any serious impact on the quality of service? Because it would be easy for organisations such as yours and indeed um, the councils to slip back to the old way of working um, when in fact we have 
uh, achieve some innovations that have proved very effective and very cost effective. So just some assurance that those um, changes won't be lost sight of in the new world order. Absolutely. And and they were actually um, already planned and in, in train prior to the, the um, pandemic. It, it's kind of almost fortuitous that they were at the point of delivery to, to benefit us through this time. But absolutely, there's a whole um, a raft of, of work that is being undertaken to looking at those new ways of working, what we want to take forward that has, has happened during the pandemic and, and make business as usual going forward. Thank you. Uh, Lisa? No. Um, no, no, no more questions. Thanks, thanks very much, Lisa. Uh, Ian? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, two from me. Uh, the first one is, in relation to the Plan 64 extra officers, does this take into account um, retirements, resignations and sackings? In other words, is, is that 64 on top of all of those that are going or is um, the retirements, etc., within that 64? So it won't be 64, it might be whatever the number is. That's the first question. Yeah, the, the 64 is is the overall increase in headcount um, after all of those things have been taken into account. Oh, that's, that's excellent. And then the, I'm, I'm not sure this one's going to be for you, Judy, so apologies if I get this wrong. But so um, obviously the chief constable's got the responsibility of where those staff go. So the question is, is how is the office and the PCC going to ensure that uh, they know where the June staff actually are now and where the September, January and March staff are planned to go. So, so I for Martin that really. Yeah, I'll come in on that um, if I could. Um, a really good question, Ian. Um, I am fully briefed. In fact, I was updated um, only on Monday as to where those officers are going. The force have identified um, several areas that need bolstering. Plus, of course, there's a commitment to putting a considerable number of those officers back on the front line um, and in the neighbourhood policing teams. Um, but I will mention out of interest that one MP, one of our MPs, uh, successfully lobbied the Chief, the Chief Constable and I for an increase in his area. Um, and I think that's really important. That's democracy in action. Um, when an MP and uh, the leader of council come and say, actually, this area here, for these reasons, does need more police officers. And, and that was successful and, and I, I helped facilitate that. And I think that is a really good example of democracy in action. And, and I, yeah, and I think it's 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 getting that assurance, isn't it, that, that, that the money is, is converted to the people to go into the places that the Chief Council is getting demand nationally, but then also you're getting quite rightly feedback where uh, us locally would like to see those police officers. So there's a, there is that, tension there i think and, and mike it's most probably for the you to consider i think it's something that we will come back to in the new year um as to see where the uplift actually has gone in other words whilst it's most probably more directed uh, from chief constable information it's still um seeing what the pcc is doing to meet those needs of the hidden crime and what the public want in terms of visibility and reassurance so I would like to ask if that, that gets put on the forward work plan at some point, please. Uh, thank that's you. Thank absolutely you. spot on point. Um, I, I can't argue with anything you've just said uh, because you've encapsulated the whole issue, which is the public want those 170 cops on their street corner. And actually some of them are going to have to go um, to uh, covert policing. Uh, and cyber crime and cyber fraud and protecting children online. Uh, and that's a, a, an awful dilemma for the Chief Constable and for me, actually. And I am very involved in those discussions. Um, and actually, uh, one, to reassure you, and two, to make sure it isn't lost, um, the panel will be aware that Chief Constable uh, makes one appearance at this panel every year, and that's on the um, this year, I think it's the 3rd of February, to, to do the precept discussion. And that's a really fair time to say to him, where are these people going? And I think it's for him to explain his logic. Um, and even if he can't give exact numbers, he'll be able to say the areas that those officers are going to, uh, because the public wants to know, don't they? And I think that's a really, I think that's a, a fair thing that I'll take away and tell him that that question's coming. Thank you very um, much. Thank you, Chair. That's me.
Yeah, thank you for that, Ian. There's two points that just fall out of that. One is uh, that these additional officers also meet the Police and Crime Commissioner's Police and Crime Plan, absolutely. which is what I've been elected to do. Yeah, uh, and secondly, that the uh, issue that Ian raised is on the forward work plan off the top of my memory. It's, it's scheduled for our uh, meeting in in February. That That's my, my memory does fade these days. Um, so thank you for that, Ian. Good questions, as always. May. Uh, th thank you, Chad. The question I was going to ask has actually been more than adequately covered by Ian, because I was going to ask about the 64 officers, so no more questions. Thank you. OK, thank you for that. And no doubt we will cover that in the future, uh, as I just outlined. Thank you for that, May. Uh, Les. Yeah, thank you. A couple of questions around the recruitment areas, please. The, the degree holder programme. Um, very few bobbies on the front line hold degrees. Some do, and I know that. Does that mean that there's going to be a blockage as people apply for promotion, go through the system, and some frustrations there could lead to people leaving the, the service? And, and I've got a second a supplement, a second question around recruitment as well later, please. So, so um, I'll come in on that one, Les. Um, I think it's too early to tell. Uh, we, we only recruited our first three-year officers during the actual um, between the two lockdowns. So uh, obviously for the members of the public watching, what Councillor Fry is talking about is that officers now achieve a degree at the same time as being a probation or police officer. And they, uh, instead of a two year probation, have a three year probation, they come out with a um, degree and qualification to be a police officer. So I think it's too early to say it is, people are alive to what you just said. Uh, and I'd, I hope that that wouldn't be a blocker. Um, but we'll have to see how that shapes out in time. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, I'm happy with that. Thank you. I understand that. And my other question is around the e-recruitment, the savings. The government don't have a good record on on um, using computers for recruitment or exams. That how does that going to work? Does that mean the new recruits will actually see and be interviewed by any by members of the Dorset Police or an HR department, or is it all online? Uh, to be honest with you, I'm not cited enough on that. So unless Julie, I see Simon's hands coming up. I was glad Simon's hand came up. I'm not <laughs> sure of that answer. Um, Simon. Um, fundamentally, this is um, an, an alliance system. So um, human resources is, a, is an alliance unit. So when well, we have a single team. So um, as you might recall, um, Councillor Fry, um, the two police forces have different ways of working. So what we've done now is we're taking steps to align our recruitment and selection and promotion um, process. And then once we've done that, which took some time, it's got to be said, we've now moved into a position whereby we can facilitate that better through the use of, um, it's basically an e-management tool. So that rather than actually physically having to, um, uh, so it, it manages everything from posting vacancies through sifting it, but it's designed to actually just make the process easier. The actual, um, uh, interaction with um, human beings hasn't changed. It's a back office system really just designed to make the process a bit more visible and um, and increase reporting. Uh, the key thing from a um, uplift perspective is that we're able to track the numbers of drops off at, at every stage in the process. So pre-application, application, sifting, uh, assessment centres, every stage of assessment centre all the way through and then able to track um, numbers of individuals and then also the various different representative categories as well. So Dorset Police is actively trying to increase the level of uh, visible BAME representation in the organisation and uh, the level of uh, female representation within the organisation. So uh, it gives us those two metrics at every stage of the process, which is something which you had to actually deliver previously on a manual basis, but this now gives it to us um, automatically, which is significant improvement. But they would still go through a formal interview with none, in front none of, of people. That's changed. None of that's, that's changed. That's fine. I, that, that's good. But I know I welcome the changes then to the e recruitment because that will make a, a beneficial difference. But I'm obviously conscious that some people, um, you pick them up at interview or you drop them out at interview because they're unacceptable or inappropriate. But thank you for that, Simon, and thank you, Commissioner. George. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question sort of follows on from Ian's um, somewhat as regards the uh, where 
the, the new officers will actually be deployed. Um, my question is actually related to the communication plan to actually market these highlights to inform the taxpayer on how this precept has been used to address their concerns and expectations that they've raised. So if you could expand a little bit or more on that in how we are going to actually highlight the fact that the precept which has been um, asked for and given is actually spent for the taxpayer. So um, we have got a plan to communicate it. I would stress that we're still in very early stages of the uplift. It's a three year program and the officers that we have recruited, uh, be it 59 or 60, um, they're still halfway through their training. So um, <clears throat> I, I take on board your point. I would suggest actually that the time to communicate that is probably January or February, just as the chief is coming to the panel to explain uh, the strategy. Um, I'll bring uh, Adam in, he's, he's up on the media bit. Adam, do you agree with that? We should look at this perhaps January and February? That, uh, but that's pretty much the plan, yes, Commissioner. So we're due to launch our precept consultation, um, hopefully um, next week. We've heard from uh, Jim and Julie about when we're going to get that final detail to enable us to do that. As part of that, of course, we'll be providing some detail on what's what's gone before and what was what was done on the last precept. Also setting out the Commissioner's views on on what's on what's to come um, and, and where that money might be required in the future um, to support that. As we do every time with our consultation, we'll make sure we, the consultation has supporting information so that people can uh, can, can get the more, de more detail as much as they um, require. But also we, we plan to put on a couple of online events as well for people to come and ask and um, uh, ask questions, which hopefully will be January time. And then, as the commissioner says, that builds up into, of course, the, that important time around the police and crime panel in February and communicating what, what is agreed in, in the budget there. Um, uh, or, or not as the case may be. So um, yes, uh, good, good extensive plans to communicate that. I would also expect the force, of course, in due course, once it's got those additional officers to to celebrate that and to communicate what um, what extra work they will be doing in what areas of that that will be um, throughout the course of next year when those officers are, are, are trained and on, on the ground. Thanks. Thanks, George. Good question. Um, Bobby. Hi, thank you. I'm not entirely sure what the question is, so if you don't mind just listening to my thoughts and then picking out a question from that, that would be really um, appreciated. A few years ago, um, we were discussing the use and, and the utilisation of apprenticeships and, and bringing that money back into force and um, really exploiting that. It's gone a bit quiet and I just wondered how that discussion's had gone, how many of those plans came to fruition, and if they're working really well, how is it supporting our MTFP, please? So uh, I'm going to bring Simon in on apprenticeships, if that's OK. Um, thank you. It's a good question, um, and it's probably fair to say that um, uh, we would have hoped that um, the plans were more developed by this stage. Uh, we're largely dependent on national structures being set up to help us deliver some of this work. It's probably fair to say, I mean, it's, it's, it would be easy to say uh, because of the pandemic, but it's, it's not that. So the issue here, I think, is that we are still awaiting um, to understand how the new delivery with regards to initial training, um, Julie's already talked about um, the degree holder entry programme, we've also got um, uh, police now within that as well. We've got different um, processes and pro and procedures for individuals to enter the police force. We're still not quite certain how the apprenticeship model fits into that. So we were hopeful that um, some of the um, uh, national and local agencies, educational establishments would be able to um, come up with some solutions or some opportunities for us to actually use apprentices within placing. That hasn't materialised as yet. And it's probably fair to say that the apprenticeship scheme as a whole hasn't really embedded um, across the wider public sector as much as we would have liked. So the 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 the, the short answer is that um, yes, we haven't managed to to deliver that um, as yet, and so it's gone quiet because unfortunately we haven't got very much to say on it. Um, that's not to say that it's dropped off though. Um, the difficulty is though is just about um, prioritisation at this moment in time. So at the moment, um, the focus has been very much led from the government um, on uplift. 
and given finite resourcing within our recruitment and, uh, and selection team, that's the area of focus. Um, we've really struggled as, as policing to um, to deliver on uplift. We've had to put, as uh, I think our members will know, quite large levels of uh, additional resourcing back into um, uh, recruitment and selection in order to deliver on the government's commitment to uplift by 20,000 officers over the next three years. Um, because that's come off the back of um, actually being quite um, light on recruitment over the, over the pre previous few years. So we still get into grips with delivery of that. And unfortunately, what has dropped off the, the national agenda in that time space is the apprenticeship scheme. Um, thank you. Um, I've just got a very quick question for first time, please, Chair. Um, about a year ago, you introduced your super innovations officer. Oh, you know, it's almost like the housewife of the uh, this Gestabler is he, trying to look where we can start saving our, our pennies and, and consequently pounds. I just wondered um, how that was going and will they feature into the next year's budget? So I'm not sure what we mean by super innovation officer. I think you're talking about our innovation fund that Simon co-chairs with the Deputy Chief Constable, Simon. Was, wasn't there a particular officer that had been brought in to try and look at these savings as well, though? Uh, that's that's correct, Councillor Dove. So um, you're talking about the efficiency and innovation officer, and um, I'll, he'll be he'll be most pleased to do, to, to be have been described as a super officer. I'll, um, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure that will get back to him because um, Steve like Steve Lyman Line manages him. Um, so he's done some sterling work for us um, in not only supporting the work of the innovation board, but also trying to get into the efficiency space as well. Um, so one of the things that um, he's been tasked with is. Um, doing um, an evaluation of the efficiencies and innovations that have been delivered through the innovation board. Um, and so I believe we are due to um, to to see the first um, feedback of those pieces of innovation and efficiency back through the board. Um, I think it's well, it's going to be next year at this stage, but early next year, probably just in time for us to um, to draw that information together and include in, a, in, an, in an update to yourselves in uh, in February. So that work is still ongoing. Um, I believe that um, his role has now been mainstreamed within the organisation. Um, uh, I know that um, there are always, always conversations about um, efficiencies and budget bills, but um, I had a conversation with the uh, Deputy Chief Constable only yesterday in which we both um, we're really pleased to um, to get to stairs from both, you know, my side from the commissioner, on his side from the chief constable, that um, despite the budget pressures that Dorset Police is under, that we are still fully committed to the innovation agenda, and um, and we'll be looking to um, continue that budget moving forward. Um, thank you, Chair. That's all. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I think it's worth also highlighting that on the uh, apprenticeship levy, um, Dorset or, or your office is paying about uh, 700k a year into the central fund for that. So um, all, all, all uh, shoulders to the wheel to make to get that money back into um, into into the use for apprenticeships within within your organisation as a whole. Um, thank thank you for that. Um, I got I've got a message here. If the people would like a, a short five minute break, um, that would be uh, if people are happy with that. Then uh, we'll reconvene here at um, 26 minutes past 12 for the next uh, item eight, health and wellbeing strategy. So if I could ask you to close your cameras down and come back at uh, 26 minutes past 12. Thank you very much. Thank you.
please. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report was written by Adam, um, and I'm going to ask Adam to introduce it. OK, thank you, Commissioner, and uh, good afternoon all again. So um, much of the content here and uh, members will have had a chance to read through the report uh, builds on an update we provided last uh, probably about a year ago to the to the panel regarding the commissioner's um, fund. But there are and there have been a number of changes in the last uh, in the last few months, as we all know, which I think are relevant. I hope to uh, to build on throughout this report. So uh, just to cover some of that ground uh, again. Uh, so about two years ago, the PCC made available a quarter of a million pound health and wellbeing fund from his annual commissioning budget. And that was to provide extra support to officers and staff. And you, you may recall uh, the commissioner described the circumstances at the time as something of a perfect storm. Um, so the work of Dorset Police had become ever more challenging, uh, demand was up and resources had, resources had regrettably shrunk during that period of time as, um, as well. And the PCC was aware that um, health and wellbeing of forced personnel was beginning to suffer as a consequence. And I know over a period of time, this panel has heard updates from the Chief Constable and the former Chief Constable about some of the extra pressures and referrals and trends that are being seen in force. Um, since that uh, announcement of, of that fund, there's a, a great deal of, of work has been undertaken by, by Dors Dorset Police. Mm -hmm. And there's some real detail provided um, here in uh, Appendix A of, of the report on, on what those initiatives are. But it's also true, as I've alluded to, that the, the operating context has, has changed significantly. So we've already talked about the uplift, of course, and welcome news, but the extra officers coming into the police force. And in September 2019, the commissioner made the point that um, Dorset had its lowest number of police officers um, since the 1980s. Uh, but of course, it'd be remiss of me not to mention the COVID-19 pandemic as well, which has brought about a whole set of new challenges um, and unseen risks to the health uh, of officers and staff. So as I talk through this paper, it's only right to say that, that things have changed considerably in a year, and that does somewhat uh, make it difficult to draw some assessment on the work that has been that has been done over the course of the year. And we just need to recognise that that context before drawing too many comparisons uh, one way or the other. But um, moving moving on then to the second page of the report, just uh, re remind members uh, again uh, that the Home Office in 2018 set out what's called a common goal for police wellbeing, and that's um, explained in the paper and it's also significant because a number of measures and uh, national measures are no longer reported on and um, so that that does make some comparisons a little bit more challenging but instead you'll see those three points there um, as for what that common goal uh, for well-being is and that the force uh, produced an evidence-based uh, strategy off the back of that uh, focusing on things like good nutrition physical activity sleep quality uh, looking at addressing the stigma of uh, mental ill health and put in a variety of different networks and support measures um, to try to try to address that. And and the the latest update a year a year later is that that strategy has been updated. So the Alliance People portfolio have developed a new health and wellbeing strategy, and that covers the period 2020 to 22. Um, and that identifies five strategic actions, which have listed at 2.5 in the report. So, and the first, every person will be a health and wellbeing champion. And, and, and really what that's talking about is that, that everyone in the organisation um, takes it seriously, advocates good behaviour for health and wellbeing and supports their staff and doesn't uh, sweep those matters under the carpet, realises it's a, it's a part of being a good, healthy organisation to take those things seriously and pass on good practice. It's, uh, the second one there, commit to the creation of a healthy psychological work environment. So we talk a lot and we will continue to talk a lot about the mental health, um, ill health and stresses on people. And again, to recognise it's not just physical ailments that cause people to be unwell and, and work. Uh, and you'll see there, which I've mentioned, number three, and COVID-19, something which, of course, um, in the last strategy didn't feature. And, and, there, and there it is, not just to look at the immediate needs, but what's what can we anticipate um, in the future with COVID-19? Uh, number the fourth, recognise the wider scope of well-being. So again, health and well-being isn't just restricted to, to the whether you're physically at work or, or feeling ill at times. There, there are there are wider implications um, that 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 over, overlap and 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 things that affect people's feelings. So I mentioned there climate change. Well, well does that be affect the way we behave and what we need to do? Does that have well-being consequences um, on on top of our anxieties? And the fifth there is about um, recruitment and retention. Um, of, of our people. So this has got um, the Dorset Police to be a good good employer, a good place to work and people to continue to want to work there and feel, and feel supported. So and that's reasonably hot off the press that the 
um, the, um, new, the, new, the new strategy across, across the alliance. Mo moving on to, to, to progress, I've, I've already out, outlined and we've discussed previously the, the initiatives that were funded by the Health and Wellbeing Fund. Uh, so the, the force initially requested uh, two, around 234,000 of the quarter million pound budget. Um, some of these were one-off purchases and, uh, and they're listed in the in Pedix A um, and others have uh, ongoing initiatives. So to give an update on those, 11 of those have evidence to benefits in the view of the health and wellbeing uh, team and, and people department, and they've been approved from force budgets for continuous funding. Um, two were uh, one-off purchases, um, and one has received funding from the National Police Wellbeing Service. Um, and there, have, there are a few others which have, haven't e e been finished or um, haven't, haven't been considered for funding because the, the evidence wasn't as, as strong that they should be continued. The latest Peel assessment list of three, three um, recognises the investment and summarised performance in the force is good, uh, reported that there was a caring culture in the force and staff felt their welfare was a priority and line managers knew how to access those wellbeing services um, and equal importance is given to both physical and mental ill health, which is good. Uh, and the force is committed to a regular budget for wellbeing, which is obviously a very positive uh, development as a permanent full time wellbeing practitioner based in, in Dorset now. Uh, I've just listed 3.5 of particular note is the provision of a dedicated psychological support program. So over 350 officers and staff who are working in, 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 in roles which are considered high risk have gone through that program and, and Devon and Cornwall have also picked that up as, as best, best practice. Uh, moving on to COVID-19 um, then. So of course, uh, and we've discussed this at length in, in other items as well and across other meetings, um, the challenges of, of the pandemic have, have affected every area of the force um, and the working support of the health and wellbeing is, is, is of course no exception. Um, we've talked previously about the specific um, issue of, of, of PPE and of, of the um, protective equipment, uh, but it's also been necessary to consider changes to a whole raft of business policies and processes um, to ensure as much as, as possible is being done to support health and wellbeing to staff. And, um, we, we mentioned uh, recruitment processes being streamlined to keep people people safe and, and uplift in that. But relatively simple things, which you would, which which may well end up being very good things, of course. But large numbers of people working from home, um, sitting on different desks and equipment. Of course, these have potential impacts on people's welfare. There's been work and well-being. There's been work that's been done by the force to make sure that people have the right equipment, that they have the right advice, that they're able to raise things if necessary, um, and that we 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 look to make changes when where, where necessary um, that we're not um, building up problems for the future now those are things which of course uh, the organization was aware of in terms of people working from home but, but as we know the volumes of people working from home have gone have gone up um, exponentially in this time in terms of the specifics of that a list at 4.4 there is a covid uh, welfare recovery plan uh, which was developed uh, and that has four pillars of activity which uh, which are listed there and and those are some supported by a, a, an interactive festival of well-being um, called Wellfest um, across October um, 20, 2020. Just moving on to performance um, and data, the well-being strategy is monitored um, via a performance pack, pack which um, the OPCC um, scrutinise. Uh, just provided a few examples um, of the data we've, um, that we've received uh, most recently. So 5.3 average working days lost and 5.4 top three reasons for sickness um, absence. I think the, the one of the interesting things to say about 5.3 is when you, we, and again, the danger of making comparisons in some of these some of these areas, especially when you look at the number of days lost, there isn't a great variation uh, on the rolling year of the last year. And you, you might expect there to have been because of the COVID and pandemic. So we don't want to read too much into that, but that is potentially positive news that some of the other work has helped um, to keep those um, figures roughly similar before, despite the um, COVID um, uh, issue that's raised. And 5.4 supports that because if you recall in the previous time we've showed this data and we listed the top three reasons for people being um, being away from work, of course, COVID wouldn't have featured. And you can see it there and, and officers and staff as being um, the third and second most um, uh, common cause of people missing days. So um, to have had that average day keeping relatively similar with that coming uh, onto the horizon. I think he's a positive, but again, w w will we know for sure now it's something to be analysed in future years. And I, I know panel members have asked, and I, I'll highlight 5.5 about comparisons with, with the national. And again, 
the the way it's been done nationally has changed and there aren't many measures for this but just to highlight the hmi cfrs dashboard which is available on um, on the website and you can view for all um, forces and, and monitor there and um, currently shows Dorset is having long-term sickness absent rates at 0.9% against the national average of 2%. And that's an improving position on the last time um, that I provided this update to the panel. And then at 5.6, 5.7, in terms of some other data to, to share with you, uh, and I've noticed in the key lines of inquiry, this is the Wellbeing Pulse Survey. So it's completed each year. And just to, um, just to reiterate, the, the, the purpose of a Pulse Survey is to very quickly take a snapshot of data at, um, at that time. So. You don't um, you don't necessarily get a response from everybody. You, um, you don't want to take too long because, of course, if you spend four or six weeks getting many more responses, things can happen. And in this instance, and um, this took place in February and had it gone on for, for eight weeks, it would have covered the COVID pandemic as well. So things really can change. But on this occasion, there were 759 responses compared to 347 the year before. I've just set out the the headline data there, and you'll see there are many of the areas are pretty similar to last time round. There are a few areas of, uh, of improvement. Um, people believing just place is a good place to work, um, and a uh, small increase in people carrying out the minimum amount of physical activity. Um, there. So just finally, in terms of uh, future developments and to, and to sum up, um, over the next six months, the focus will be on core, of course, on embedding the new health and wellbeing strategy across both forces. Um, this will be supported by a refresh of the branding, which is used to communicate to officers and staff across the Alliance. Um, and obviously the force will be working hard and across the Alliance will be working hard to, to look up best practice, learning from COVID, what things are on the horizon, what might need to be done, um, not just to prevent those issues occurring, but um, to help with the recovery um, for, for colleagues who've been affected, particularly by COVID-19. Um, and we're also working with health and wellbeing colleagues to consider any underspend for the PCC's fund and there is a small amount. So, uh, Chair, uh, panel, uh, a high level overview of the work here. Um, it, it's recognised there are some small increases in sickness absence, of course, but, but as I've said before, we have to be cognizant this is an unusual year and comparisons with data one way or the other, I, I just want to be cautious of, um, but, a, but, a, but of course, we'll continue to evaluate the success of the health and wellbeing strategy um, or otherwise and uh, I'm otherwise very happy to take questions. Thanks very much Adam uh, and thank you uh, for your excellent report as well, much appreciated. Um, Martin, is there anything you would want to add before uh, I open this to the panel? No Chair, as you said, uh, excellent report, very good summary, good overview, uh, over to the panel for questions, thank you. Uh, one thing that uh, there was Adam, uh, there was a Pulse Survey Wellbeing um, graphic that was issued at one stage do you are you still doing that i, th I think we do i think we do have that i'm very happy to um find a copy and circulate if i can would you circulate that out to the panel the last one i've got is march 19 thank you very much so moving on to the panel then um may you're first up uh, thank you chair just have uh, one question Again, I welcome the report uh, and I thank Adam for presenting it. It's just to do with uh, ooh, the table 5.3, uh, where you have uh, some numbers there. And I'm just wondering, when the survey was done, was there a distinction between frontline staff and non-frontline staff? And the reason I'm asking this is because, particularly with, with COVID and everything that's been going on, that maybe I have the wrong perception that perhaps frontline staff get more um, get more grief I suppose is the way I'd put it uh, than non-frontline staff and, and whether there is actually slightly different streams of work for frontline and non-frontline staff thank you so, so the, the the information certainly is broken down by di by different department and, and the different roles that uh, officers and staff have and that some of the schemes which we and um, detailed are aimed specifically at people who are more likely to, for example, have physical confrontation with members of the public and have musculoskeletal injuries. They're also the psychological program that's aimed at those roles that are, um, the, the staff, uh, officers and staff more likely to face traumatic, traumatic incidents. So working in road policing um, or frontline roles. So the information, yes, is broken down uh, and available to the force for that. So the schemes are tailored um, for um, um, in those ways. Um, and and absolutely to, to answer your question, there is a difference, um, of course, but 
uh, and you can see different types of illness and ailments are more common in certain types of work, as you'd expect if you're in a more desk based job, you're less likely um, perhaps to, to sustain an injury on, on, on duty than if you're out on patrol. Yep, thank, thank, thank you, Chair. No more questions. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, moving on to Ian. Uh, morning, Adam. Uh, thank you for the report. Um, it's, it's just it might be my misunderstanding here, um, so bear with me. Um, counting and comparing days lost through sickness um, has traditionally been a way of seeing how a forces um, work around well-being and um, uh, supporting staff is going. The suggestion I took was that nationally that's not the view. But without that, how do you know whether the wellbeing strategy is working? That's the question. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a real dilemma, I'd, uh, I'd agree. And I, I know there's been some um, frustration that um, some of the national measures have, have, have been removed. But uh, the main way that the force has looked at that is to look at its own data year to year to see whether it's been improving um, and the pulse surveys. It's also fair to say that in the strategy, there have been some other measures. So the, the common goal is, is is, is looking more at in the first instance in some instances in actually the increase in referrals and people going for things like recognizing it's been reduced so so actually some of the forces measures aren't so much now on uh, whether how they compare nationally um, with other forces but are we getting more referrals for say mental health uh, triage schemes and things and, and and if so that we at this point we consider that to be a to be a good thing but yeah it, uh, you know I absolutely agree it's it, they, they, they changed the benchmark. So, so but, but for the benefit of the Dorset public who, who pay the money for people to be working, what you're saying is, is that you've seen the shortcomings of just um, relying on the base figure of how many days are lost, but coupling that with uh, what, what, what's being done to support people, but also making sure that other things like debt management um, isn't something that's been hidden within sickness because that would be part of a, a, a wider strategy, I assume, to make sure that where someone is having some debt issues, which, which can happen, they, they aren't covering that up by, by sick days. They're actually finding some way that the organisation can support them to keep them at work um, to then deal with, it, with what the issue is rather than it being sickness, for example. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. And uh, Probably won't surprise you here. There's a far more open culture than there has been in the past with those sorts of matters. And yeah. So we, we we see those referrals and incidents go up compared to how they would have been in say 80s, 90s, early 2000s. But and that's and that's considered to be a positive thing that people are reaching out and getting the assistant. And the force has a sophisticated um, uh, arrangements in, in in professional standards uh, alongside the wellbeing work to make sure those things are, are kept. And, um, so just to sort of conclude it, so you know anyone's listening organisationally, the force is still ensuring that its main aim is to look after its staff to ensure that they can attend work and to do the work yeah. that the public want. Absolutely, and that's right. That's right at the heart of the Commissioner's Health and Wellbeing Fund. So I, I remember hearing some comments uh, that were made about what you know why invest in in the work in the workforce and um, in in that way. What, but now, of course, the obvious answer is uh, you protect the protectors. Make sure that those those people yeah. are fit and healthy and at work more. Absolutely agree. Thank you very much for that. That's me done. Thanks, Ian. Um, Lisa? Do you have any questions you'd like to raise? No, I don't have any questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Bobby? No questions. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. George? Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I don't have a question as such. I just uh, wanted to pass my uh, recognition on because it's far too often um, that uh, people see the uniform and not the uh, person behind the uniform and the family behind them. So I'm very supportive of um, this report and the exercise which you're doing. Um, the thing which caught my um, uh, caught my eye was uh, the outside factors such as climate change and so on and so forth that have now been taken into consideration rather than just the operational duties and obviously um, with um, the uh, the demands upon the police force now as regards COVID but also for um, 
policing uh, the right to assemble and to and to protest. It's it's an additional strain to the human beings behind the uniform. So I appreciate and I'm really pleased that the uh, the forces recognise that and putting in those allowances. It's been far too um, it's been far too often that those in uniform and you identify it yourself is that the stigma of mental health, which is something which anybody wearing a uniform, um, providing a public service uh, has had to hide before. And I appreciate the fact that everybody then is a champion and that actually we have to bring this out into the open. We have to deal with it as an occupational hazard rather than it um, being a stigma that it's something a failing in the human being behind the uniform. So I really appreciate this report and the work that's been done by the force. Thanks, George. Um, Les. Thanks, Chair. No, I just welcome this report. I welcome the extra support for welfare officers in there. The, for, the police officers and police staff have a unique role to play in all areas and what affects one person won't affect another one. Um, we all have different abilities of robustness. So giving them adequate support is really, really good and to be thanked for because that will make a big difference to that. Is there much work, Adam, being done on the mental health side of stuff at the moment? Because the figures there, are, as George said, are both high. What else can we do there to support officers? Um, yeah, there, there, there's a great deal in in train um, in, in, tra in train there, um, and um, we mentioned earlier. So it's a, it's a constant it's a constant train of work. And uh, earlier in the quarterly plan, for for example, um, uh, sessions were set out specifically to highlight some of the difficulties through COVID. Um, are made available free mental health workshops for emergency service workers. Um, so those sorts of initiatives, uh, are every available opportunity we, we, we seek to, to fund and put and put people through and to constantly raise awareness about the issues and the places uh, uh, people can get get help um, from. But it's a, yeah, without without wanting to spend a yeah, we could spend the mm. whole minute so uh, the whole meeting talking about it. There are constantly a range of initiatives being um, proposed by the, the uh, health and wellbeing team in force um, and being and being looked at across the alliance and seeking best practice across the piece so uh, I'm, I'm sure in future panels as well we will continue to talk about more that we we funded Adam do you think there's any work that could be done around people joining the organization making them aware of the events they could face they will they will come across traumatic events traumatic incidents and maybe some people are not prepared for that when they join the organisation. Yeah, I think that's an interesting uh, observation, and I, I'd agree. I, I do know that there's been additional work on the on the training to make sure that people are better better prepared. And and also, of course, it, it, I mean, organisationally, it makes good sense if you're going to make that investment that people are fully briefed. But um, I, I'd agree. I'm sure there could be more more done. But it's a, it's a it's an operational matter uh, and a detail that I don't I don't have at my fingertips. I'm afraid. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Les. Um, Sherry. Um, yes, just briefly, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, we've mentioned uh, frontline staff. On now, non-frontline staff, they might be more likely to be impacted by the stresses arising from working from home. And there is some evidence indeed that the, the stresses from working from home are not experienced exactly the same by men and women. In other words, that the men and women have different stresses from working from home. This is a relatively new area of, of welfare work because we, we've never been here before. So I would just like some assurances um, that this is in, embedded in your wellbeing program and that you recognize these new stressors and that it's given suffi sufficient visibility that people have a context and that a place where they can discuss these new stresses because um, it's not, it is um, mental health, of course, but it's also other things, including, for example, career progression, you know, uh, working from home can in the in the fullness of time have an impact on career progression and job satisfaction so i'd just like some assurance that that's embedded in there thank you yeah absolutely really really good just really good points is um uh, made as well uh, uh, councillor the the covid recovery plan does specifically include that in a variety of sub themes about working from home 
Uh, the force has made changes to its policy, some temporary, some likely to be permanent uh, across a range of things. There might be recruitment, training, um, and, and various other areas as well to, to recognise some of these changes and to make sure that um, a few specific things. There's a risk assessment that's been done for all staff in the organisation, uh, first specifically about the impact, uh, the health impact, direct health impacts of the pandemic on them or whether they're at risk, but, but also some of the wider issues. And there's also been a, what's called a new ways of working um, group set up um, in force to, to look at the things that have worked really well, to look at those things which um, perhaps haven't, but are possibly part of the short term, maybe medium, longer term future, um, and also to get feedback from staff. So all departments have a, a, a point of contact that feeds into that to make sure that not just frontline, where, as you rightly say, perhaps that's more apparent to people, the, the impact, but also in other functions, how is this how is this affecting the way that people work in uh, in, in about their day to day and recognising that for some people, the home environment is not as good to work in as, as the office. And it's worth saying that the force um, has put all the COVID secure measures in place and including uh, our team. I'm in the, the office at Winfrift um, today because I, I have young children. and I didn't want them crying through the meeting, um, but but it's a COVID secure environment. There is an option for staff where possible to come into those into that secure environment and still work in, in the office. It's important to stress that um, as well, but also just to capture um, in the future well, any adjustment that needs to be made to, to the estate um, and for, for people and processes and to make sure that things like that hopefully don't become um, too much of a feature. Thanks, Joe. Good question. Um, David? Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. A couple of observations have been noticed with your stats and figures is some of them are getting worse, but looks like they are being dealt with. Uh, stress and all that sort of thing. There is two new organisations, I'm wondering if you're aware, in Dorset, which have just been launched out since the beginning of COVID. One is called the Gap Project, which we, we me and there is the form in Dorset and across Dorset, and also a, couple, a group of people called The Retreat, which is in Queen's Avenue in Dorchester is some of the other organisations which which are very quiet, shall we say, and can be approached without, without absolute uh, privacy involved. So there's a couple more areas there. So the things that, just to say that it is a problem right across the board, not just with the police, it's everywhere. And the things that uh, I just will say, fantastic report, brilliant, well done. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adam. Again, as you can tell, uh, the panel's really appreciative of the work that you've put into producing this excellent report. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to move on to item nine, uh, fraud and cyber plan. Uh, hand over to Martin to introduce this. Chair, sorry, can I can I just interrupt a second? Sorry, Mark. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah, go on. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm conscious that we're with this next item, we're likely to go over the, the three hours. Um, that's set out within the constitution. So we just need um, somebody to propose and uh, second that the meeting extends. And I'd suggest perhaps to, unless you think otherwise, to 1.30 perhaps. Yeah, 1.30. Can I have a proposal, please? A second. <laughs> yeah, done. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Hand over to Mark. Uh, uh, Martin, sorry. Thanks, Chair. Um, so, this is my third uh, fraud and cyber plan update since I've been police crime commissioner. Simon wrote this paper uh, and he's going to present it and then I'll come in for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. We, we've obviously all read the paper, so um, six points, if that's OK with you. Okay, that's perfectly fine with me, Chair. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so as uh, Commissioner has already said, members would have heard a number of updates from the Commissioner of Fraud and Cyber Crime over the years. Um, but I thought it helpful just to set out the context of some of that local activity to start off with. Um, it's recognising that the terms fraud and cybercrime are, are generally used interchangeably, um, but this is because fraud is often um, electronic related and cybercrime refers to a computer or to internet related crime. And so the two terms do overlap. Um, in my introduction to the paper, I've highlighted that nationally fraud continues to increase. And over the past year, um, nationally around £1.9 billion has been lost through over 340,000 incidents. Um, the picture in Dorset is in line with the national trends and rates, with a little over 4,200 reports of fraud or cybercrime being made, with nearly £17 million lost in the county. Um, I think members would 
well recognise and understand that fraud and cybercrime are globalised and operates in a cross-border fashion. And fraudsters exploit new technologies to distance themselves from their victims, which means that such crimes are best tackled by placing capabilities that also match that kind of structure so that are able to operate nationally and internationally. So it's I thought it helpful just to kind of quickly set out what those structures are. So at the top, we have action fraud. Action fraud is responsible for taking the reports. It's the UK's National Reporting Centre. It receives all fraud and cybercrime reports from members of the public, and it collects these reports, it sifts them, and it acts as a point of contact for all fraud cases. Um, it's um, delivered by a, a third party supplier by a private enterprise, but it's run by the City of London Police, who also offers support to the National Fraud Intelligence Bureau. Um, the NFIB, National Fraud Intelligence Bureau, that receives all of the action fraud reports. It takes all that information, assesses them, and then passes them on to the correct agency for investigation. So they build case files and they pass that on to national, regional and local policing agencies for further work as they see fit. And um, within that mix is the City of London Police. Uh, the City of London Police are the national policing lead for economic crime. And so they provide specialist support and guidance to both action fraud and to the NFIB. They also offer some support to individual police forces, uh, to other law enforcement agencies like the National Crime Agency, and also directly to industry. Um, they also um, hive off those investigations for those frauds that have the highest harm or particular um, national or international um, uh, issues as well. Um, that really is the kind of um, national filtering structure. Um, going through all that then we moved on to the investigation side and we have um, the National Crime Agency. So the National Crime Agency is responsible for targeting criminals and groups that pose the biggest risks to the United Kingdom. So in terms of fraud and cybercrime, it conducts its own operations, it supports partner agencies and it supports regions. But it takes that information from uh, the NFIB in the City of London and manages those case files that have a national um, uh, footprint. We also have um, regional organised crime units, so they are regional fraud teams within those um, those organised crime units. And so for Dorset, we have the uh, regional, the Southwest Regional Organised Crime Unit, and within that, the regional cybercrime unit. And so that supports uh, Dorset crimes, which also have regional links and also does a lot of um, uh, front facing engagement work with local communities and regional communities as well. And then finally, we have the local response through Dorset Police. Um, it's worthwhile saying that not all police forces actually have their own dedicated local resources dedicated to tackling fraud and cybercrime. However, in Dorset, we do. Uh, this is the Dorset Police Economic Crime Unit. And um, in the paper, I included a link to a, a recent video um, by um, mm. DI Andrew Kennard, who heads up that team. Um, it's only three or four minutes long. I'd encourage uh, members to quickly have a look at that because that explains the, um, uh, the role of that unit very well. Um, Gerald, I'll then move on to the, the, the commissioner's work, if I may. Um, so the commissioner's work focuses on four main areas which are set out in uh, in one four. So that's around commissioning and supporting policing services, um, awareness raising, the scrutiny of policing activity and then national advocacy and campaigning. Um, so Chair, what I've done here uh, is to provide some background and a little uh, highlight activity under each strand. And then I've included a bit more detail on the latest piece of activity under each one. So hopefully demonstrating give a flavour of the kind of activities that are they're undertaken. Uh, you'll appreciate, of course, this is not a, an exhaustive list. So what I'll do then, just for, for, for brevity really, recognising that members have, will have had the opportunity to, to read this paper beforehand, is just pick up a, a quick highlight from each one, if I may. So, um, so on commissioning, uh, members be, will be well aware of Chris Conroy, who is the Dorset Police Cyber Protect and Prevention Officer whose role it is to promote cybercrime awareness and to share crime prevention tools and advice. Um, Chris um, spends a lot of time working with at-risk populations in Dorset, uh, sometimes directly, sometimes through the work of other agencies, 
but his role predominantly in this space is working with at-risk vulnerable communities and helping to dispel the stigma around becoming a victim of fraud or cybercrime and trying to drive up the level of reporting. It's a real important factor to, to try and land this. Um, a lot of people will be um, quite unfortunately ashamed or embarrassed about having been taken in by a, a confidence fraudster. Um, we should always remember that cyber criminals are often professionals and unfortunately they are often very skilled at what they do. And there is absolutely no shame or, or embarrassment in being taken in by these fraudsters. The police will absolutely take the reports very, very seriously and deal with it sensitively. And, and sometimes, unfortunately, people who have suffered fraud, but only suffered, inverted commas, a, a minor loss, a relatively minor loss in terms of money, um, they may think, oh, well, it's not enough to, to report to the police. Well, no, please do report it to the police. So first of all, we recognise that even the loss of a small amount of money can still be devastating. And secondly, it also factors into our intelligence and our ability to actually target some of these fraudsters. So please do take the time to um, to report um, uh, matters to action fraud and then they'll be be um, managed uh, sensitively throughout that process. Um, so then just on to uh, awareness raising. Um, this the, the activity that the office has undertaken there is listed at section three. Um, but what we've done in the in the period of the pandemic is that we really realised that actually what we're trying to do here is we're trying to mitigate against online criminals. And so we should really take steps to make sure that our engagement approach matches. Previously, we've done a lot of face to face engagement and, and Chris Conroy's focused on going into work and going to community groups and speaking face to face with businesses and the like. But actually what we thought we should do is actually try and use the same tools that cyber fraudsters use. And so last month we hosted a virtual engagement session uh, the focusing on fraud and cyber security that was broadcast live. Um, so that was uh, hosted by um, uh, by BBC journalist Lawrence Herdman. Very grateful for his um, his contribution to that. Um, we had about 30 people join us on the live event, which was which was great. Um, really good questions, uh, really challenging questions, um, and that um, has been recorded and is now available um, via the PCC's YouTube channel. Um, so then, Chef, I may moving on to the scrutiny of police activity. Um, I thought it'd be useful on this area to talk through the um, the spotlight activity that I've highlighted in um, paragraph 4.5. So this one is around the historic lack of access to fraud data um, and the impact that has had on the PCC being able to provide effective scrutiny. So until quite recently, Although police forces were required to return data on fraud outcomes to the Home Office, these data were aggregated to a national level, which meant that local fraud data wasn't particularly visible. And that meant that the management and scrutiny of individual force performance was quite difficult and quite challenging. Um, now, the Police Crime Commissioner, as part of his national portfolio responsibilities for fraud, had made representations to the NPCC leads for cyber and economic crime a number of times. Um, highlighting that the local visibility and accountability of fraud offences sits with police and crime commissioners and they should be equipped to have access to that data so they can hold um, chief constables and police forces to account. Um, now, obviously, that wasn't just the commissioner making that particular representation, that was made by a number of different commissioners and also from a number of different areas. And so it has now been addressed, it did take its time in being addressed, but we've now addressed that and PCCs have now got access to local fraud data and have had that for the past year or so. Um, so these data are now included in the Forces Strategic Performance Board and they're subject to the necessary scrutiny. Um, I've included in both of those here for, for, for highlights um, and for transparency. So the, um, the first um, line there is the um, is the, the data that um, uh, the number of fraud incidents uh, in, uh, from, from a Dorset police perspective over last year. And members will see that actually that falls very much in line with the national picture, which is set up below. Um, finally, Chair, just on um, national advocacy and campaigning, which is listed at section five. I think it's um, fair to say the improvement of which the, the Police and Crime Commissioner is most proud 
um, is that he has been consistently and enduringly challenging around the effectiveness of action fraud. Um, and finally, that has now been recognised, um, albeit it should be said that that was partially as the result of a, an undercover investigation by a team of, of, of national journalists. But the, the government has now recognised that some of the deficits within that particular scheme and has agreed not to renew the existing supply contract and actually has taken a step to block that particular supply from delivering further government contracts. Um, now, the latest on this news is that the government is now indicating that there will be an uplift in the funding envelope for the letting of, uh, of a new five-year contract for action fraud, um, but we're still awaiting the final figure and details around that particular contract. Um, but that's obviously a, a really um, good, um, good result from, from, from our perspective. Um, Chair, I hope that really quick overview helps. Um, it, it's fair to say that the fraud and cybercrime continue to be a, a really significant and challenging um, issue for the policing as a whole. But here in Dorset, we do recognise that these crime types are more effectively managed at a national scale, um, albeit the, the PCC will continue to support the, the many dedicated officers and staff in Dorset Police who are working hard to tackle this ever-growing problem. Um, happy to, um, to take any questions. Thanks that very much for that, Simon, and thanks uh, for your excellent report as well. Um, both reports, both yours and Adam's, have firmly answered the panel's uh, key lines of inquiry, which we submitted to you uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I particularly like the way that you've structured your report, um, which mirrored exactly the key lines of inquiry, which made it far easier for us to to, to comprehend. Uh, Martin, before I offer it up to the panel, um, any points you'd like to raise? No, I, th I think Simon's covered all of it. And um, to be fair, he has given national and local and regional. So I think it's a really good report and I second your comment. Thank you. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, <coughs> open, open up questions to the, to the panel. Um, Sherry first. A good report, no questions. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Lisa? Hi. Um, yeah, it just it just made me think of um, it was a really good report and really interesting. Uh, something that happens to me uh, so often is that a legitimate company such as Electricity or the bank will phone up and ask me for my personal details at the beginning of the call, which I think throws the whole message that we're trying to give to people not to give details. And I wonder if this um, issue can be um, raised at a sort of national level somehow. Um, so, so they phone up and they say, can I confirm your name? And then they say, well, can you confirm to me your date of birth, your address, you know, all of this personal information. And I know they are genuine and I always say no. And I don't really see why they do need to um, ask for all of that personal detail because they are actually phoning you on your phone that you've given that information. Um, uh, and I just think while they, these companies make this a very normal thing, people are going to fall into that trap of starting to give information. And I know that people um, who do this do reflect back that information. So they will say, oh, I see from our records, after you've told them that you live in, your address is in Dorset, they'll say, oh, as a Dorset person, you know, they give the impression from the information you've already given them. So. I wonder if you thought of that as an issue and if it could be raised. Thank you. It's a it's a really good, um, really good point. And I think um, it's also worth saying that, um, that that none of us are immune to um, to these particular issues as well. Um, ironically, um, as we've been on this morning, um, uh, the the OPCC received um, the entire OPCC team received an email from me that wasn't from me. Um, um, uh, so you know, I think um, I think it's uh, it's certainly a challenge. I think on, on with regard to the particular um, issue, um, the the use of personal data is um, is a difficult subject, and I think sometimes that what happens within industry is that it's used as a shortcut to say, well, okay, um, can you just confirm this? And it's like, well, there's no need for them to actually confirm that data because they that what what is the 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 need to say that you you're speaking to the account holder? Um, the information that you're generally being asked to 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 uh, 
purchase a new add-on to a to a product that you already own. There's no need for them to go through that that verification process. And I think the conversation um, is a national one that's happening around this space. So Martin's done an awful lot of lobbying um, with regards to um, uh, how best we can actually uh, improve the, um, the 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 the, the system of delivering against crimes that already happened. Um, fraud prevention, though, is a, is a new area which I think that um, we are relatively underinvested in. Um, we've taken some steps now. We're just building a, a, a new cyber resiliency centre across the southwest. And I think the opportunity to highlight some of those issues through that regional structure back to the national to see if some of those conversations can be raised at a national level. Um, is a really, really important one. So um, I think, um, thank you for that. I'll take that forward with them if I may. Thanks, Lisa. Um, David Taylor. Yeah, thank you very much. Terrifically good point raised by um, before, because when I go to Boots to collect my medicines, they ask my first line, my address, my postcode, my name, and it's out in the blue, out in the public, so anybody can hear it and see what's going on and work on it. And I think it's really annoying that you, and you sometimes it confirm your, your date of birth. So someone stood behind you collecting all this information to go off to your house, rob it, or all sorts of other things. So there's there's a massive mark out there which needs to be tightened up. And just just necessary. and funnily enough, as you said, Simon, I had a phone call about an hour ago from Zimbabwe. It's weird. They are everywhere. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you very much. Just want to raise that. Um, yeah, it's sort of picking up from the point that Simon has just made about the prevention. It, it seems, given the nature of the of fraud and cyber enabled crime, that the detection of it is more and more likely at national or regional level, but the prevention of it is more at the regional and local level. So my question is, what plans do you see as the PCC, both financially and resourcing wise, that you'll be pushing the Chief Constable to do on the prevention of this type of crime locally? So <clears throat> it's a really good question. I think I'd answer it in two ways. Um, what Simon's report didn't mention was the recent review uh, into fraud uh, by Craig Mackey. Um, has suggested that the triage that um, at the moment DI Kennard and the ECU that you heard about are um, doing for Dorset, the triage should be regional. So the Southwest ROCU will be the triage for all fraud. Um, picking up your point that actually dealing with offenders uh, is more regional and national than local. So, uh, and I see that happening in the next year. In fact, I see it happening next week when the, when the government settlement comes out. I think they're going to increase the money for Rocky to uh, allow them to be the triage for the region, which means consistency. It means a more focused approach and it can mean that we can uh, detect more offenders. That wasn't your question, but I'm just putting that into the, the context that actually when that happens and it will happen, then the, the, you're right the key drive for Dorset Police will be to prevent fraud rather than detect, to detect it because the Rockies are now triaging and allocating offences. So um, what the Chief Constable and I are doing at the moment is we've commissioned a review of the way we deal with schools, how we prevent uh, crimes in schools, um, and that review has been published this week in fact. And one of the key drivers for that is this issue, because actually if you're talking about keeping people safe, it's too late to catch someone at 64. Um, it's you need to catch them at 16 because of the online fraud issue. Um, and so I would see uh, the new commissioner because the chief constable isn't going to change and he's very committed to school education and school um, prevention. Uh, I think that we will be doing a lot more school education on keeping yourself safe online, which generationally will feed through. Uh, and the second thing, I can't speak for a new commissioner, but I know the police are very keen to um, do more in this space to keep people safe uh, because it is going more and more online. I hope that answers what you were saying. It does. And Chair, I think, you know, the, the, this fraud and cybercrime has come back to the panel quite a lot. 
I think the work that um, the office had to do to, to give us this report is 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 a lot. And the next time we visit it, I think we need to focus it more to the prevention side that's being done locally, that the PCC can actually directly influence and finance. So I would ask that we um, focus in our next visit to crime, uh, to cyber crime and the fraud, to that local prevention area and work for two fronts. One, because I think we give um, such a broad question to the OPCC that it, Simon and his staff had to spend a lot of hours to cover too much, that a lot of it we actually just know. Whereas if we focus on what our PCC should be doing around this subject, which I would would suggest is prevention, that's where we should go next. Okay, thank I'm you for that. Point, as I, support, always. I support that, Chair. I think that's a really good call. Um, fraud is a huge subject. It's a third of all crime. Um, and actually, Ian's right, as we move to a regional response to fraud, which we will do in the next 12 to 18 months, actually the Police Crime Commission should be in the prevention space more than anything else. And I think that's a really good call to say, what am I doing to hold the police to account in this space? And what am I doing to alert people yeah. to fraud, particularly businesses? So, um, yeah, really good call. Yeah, I fully endorse that. Mark, can you make a note of that, please? Um, Les. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, good report. And as we know, fraud is ongoing. Welcome the prevention and all the work going on behind that. One thing we haven't really, done, and I think, touched on is about the detection of crime and what chance have Mrs Miggins got of getting her money back or getting the offender brought to justice, wherever that may be. And, and there's various things because, from my knowledge, action fraud used to sometimes record the, the incident and it just went into this big, big black hole of nothing happening to it. Is there any reassurance you can give those listening that their crime will be investigated by someone? I, I can because, um, as, as Simon's already alluded to, I, I sit on um, a working group nationally looking at replacing action fraud. And it isn't just about replacing action fraud. It's about the lead force, the City of London, being better and more reactive to fraud. So um, on Monday, I received a presentation from Commissioner Ian Dyson from the city um, and that the City of London have introduced four new teams of police officers to react more um, quickly to fraud that as, as it happens. Uh, the, the detection rate at the moment is 8% for fraud reported in this country. That is better than I thought it would be, actually, but it's still not good enough. No, we're near good enough. And so they've set up these uh, rapid response teams from an intelligence point of view and from a deployment point of view, and some specialist teams to deal with business crime in the city which will make them far more um, aggressive, if you like, in tackling this crime and in getting more offenders brought before the courts. So I am I think we're in a good space with fraud. I've seen more change, more drive, more acceptance that we're not getting it right in the last two years than I've seen in the last eight. And actually, I really support putting this down to a regional level so that the City of London as the lead force with all these specialist teams that are now being introduced can go straight to the southwest rock you and say there's your offender he lives in bristol and all the victims live in dorset over to you let's get that done i think it's we're going to get better and i'm reassured by that thank you that's a really good note very welcome to hear that thank you excellent thanks chair yeah thank you there's good good question and, and excellent response thanks martin appreciate that um george You're on mute, George. <clears throat> oh, boom. Now you're on mute. <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry for that. Nothing further to add other than that it is, as you say, a huge um, uh, area of crime, one third, you say. But it's the impact. It's the impact of families. It's the impact for the vulnerable. It's the impact for looking out for your parents, etc. I'm sure that there's not a single member watching um, this presentation of the public or, or even on this panel that haven't had a family member uh, affected by fraud. And I really like the fact that it's brought out that it's a constant battle to get ahead. Um, so therefore, I think the prevention and the education is the, the ideal way and going into schools, etc. So it becomes part of the natural psyche 
that you just don't give out your details. And I think working with the corporations, et cetera, that ask for these personal details because it's become so, oh, I hold my phone up and I do the thing or I punch my pin code in or I read out the three digits on the back of my, of my card. It's become part of the national psyche that is just what is done. And we need to change that psyche. And I think the only way is, well, not the only way, but it does have to start far earlier. Um, and to the commissioner's point, is is too late for a 65-year-old. But the grandchild of that 65-year-old is part of the um, the education process to, to protect families and to protect the public. So I, I really, really appreciate this report. I really appreciate the work that the commissioner has done on lobbying for this and and, and pushing this forward at a national and a regional level. Thanks very much for that, George. Thank you. Um, and um, I've got a couple of hands up. Bobby next. No questions, thank you. Sherry? I just wanted to say, Mr Chairman, don't underestimate the 64-year-olds and the upwards. They're perfectly well able to learn and understand new things, and they are by far the most, at the moment, the most vulnerable to this. Um, so, so please don't say, oh, we can't do anything about the people over 60. We really can. Um, most of the people on this panel probably fall into that category, and we wouldn't care to be told that we can't learn new things. And the other thing is, since I've got the microphone, um, when you're in schools, I hope you're also, because we do know that a lot of this crime is being committed by um, really very young people, quite often young people working alone in their bedrooms. And I hope that you use the opportunity to explain to those young people that these this is not victimless crime and to uh, in, impress upon them how grave the consequences can be because sometimes young people don't necessarily have that understanding and, and would think that this is an all right thing to do in the way that they would never dream of going out and say mugging someone, just a thought. So, um, yeah, fair point um, from Councillor Jefferson. Uh, obviously I was talking about myself when I said 64 year old. Um, uh, and you're right, I don't like us off at 64, particularly, uh, but I will come in because it's a really good chance to plug the fact that we are about the seventh highest risk area in the country for fraud because of the, our elderly population. And actually the elderly population is really vulnerable. So a really good point made there by Sherry. The second point, um, I, I totally share your view, Sherry. The problem with social media is that um, the youth of today grow up without empathy. And if you don't have empathy, then you don't, um, you're not victim focused. And so that, that, that there's bullying going on on the, on the internet with 13, 14, 15 year olds, which is all about the fact that children don't have empathy for each other. And it's really scary actually, because if we don't change the next generation, that will become standard in our society. And it's really worrying. Thank you for that, uh, Martin. Final question from me, um, briefly, um, what support have you been given being uh, what support have you given to see those that are victims of cybercrime? So um, we treat the, the well, the, there's two answers to that. Um, you'll remember that in 2015, 14, 15, I lobbied the then Home Secretary Theresa May to um, improve the services for action fraud because action fraud were receiving crimes and then not giving victims. Uh, any support whatsoever. So we now have a, a double net, if you like. The first one is that Action Fraud nationally now has a victims unit who actually liaise with victims. If a f member of Dorset owns up, then the victims unit at Action Fraud will engage with them. And the double hit is that our local victim support will also engage as well. But that's never been, that wasn't the case four or five years ago. So I think we've got a lot better. Um, it, but actually offering victim support to a person who's lost their life savings, well, that doesn't happen very often. It is happening in Dorset. That is never going to repair the damage, sadly. OK, thank you for that. Um, moving on to item 10, Mark, or oh, sorry, Ian. Yep. Hello there, Chair. Sorry about that. A little delay. Um, complaints then. So in this quarter, there's been two new complaints. Uh, the first one um, was considered by the Chief Executive from the OPCC as per the legislation and the underpinning policy. 
and has not been upheld and they will um, deal with notifying that person. A second complaint that came in has been submitted to the OPCC uh, for again the legislation and policy to be applied to it. I would also point out that in addition two former complainants um, are still um, following their matters via the FOI routes, Freedom of Information route. Uh, that is a matter for Dorset Council as they are the host authority and they are dealing with that, but it isn't a matter for the Police and Crime Panel um, in its entirety or the Complaint Subcommittee. And that's your update for this quarter. Sorry, that's me. And again, didn't have the mic on. Uh, Mark, if I could ask you to lead on the nomination for the subcommittee, please. I also, um, I obviously underestimated the length of the panel a little bit. So uh, if we're going to overrun three minutes, we probably just need to extend it by another another ten minutes or so to finish the um, the agenda off. If that's okay, Chair. Yep. If you're going to get seek somebody to propose. propose. And I can second. Thank you. OK, so um, the complaint subcommittee uh, has, a, has a vacancy. Um, so with the purpose of the committee, I won't go into a huge amount of detail on it, but it's to consider complaints made by the public against the police and crime commissioner. Uh, in the first instance, investigation is by the, the OPCC's chief executive. But the panel will be, the, sorry, the committee, subcommittee will review where the complainant is not satisfied with the review undertaken by the chief executive. And then aside from those uh, those meetings it will also meet annually usually in around September each year so we're, so we're looking for um, a volunteer from the committee to sit on that panel so again chair if we could uh, if we could have a proposal and, and a seconder for, for a volunteer please I understand May Haynes has uh, volunteered uh, and she has now left the meeting um, so could I hand back to you Mark please Yes, so I mean that that's that's fine. So Councillor Haynes has confirmed in the side panel that she's happy. If someone would like to propose Councillor Haynes, I propose David Taylor. And I can second. Thank you. So that, that's fine. That, that that's done then, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, moving on to the work plan. Okay, right. so that's, that's myself again. So I'll, I'll keep this one very brief because the, the work plan is set out in the report. I guess it's, it's just probably worth a reminder for the for the panel that we have the informal budget briefing on the 14th of January 2021. And then the next formal meeting is the 4th of February for the preset meeting. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. And just to remind panel members that the uh, 4th of February meeting, uh, we will do the precept in the morning and then hold the quarterly review in the afternoon. Um, I trust there's no urgent items, Mark? No, no nothing. Uh, and we have no exempt business, is that correct? That is correct, yes, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me take this opportunity also to uh, congratulate the OPCC on the three webinars that you held uh, last month. Um, they were all um, well worth the effort. I thought the uh, idea of having um, I use the term loosely, a professional hosting the, the um, event was, uh, a, was an excellent idea. So congratulations to the OPCC on, on holding those webinars, um, if that's the right term. Um, I'm about to close this meeting, unless anybody's got anything they specifically wish to raise now, but if you could put your camera on if you wish to speak, I see no cameras other than Martin, so therefore I'm assuming that nobody wishes to speak. Therefore, I'm now going to formally close this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. So